Passion Church. For more information about Passion Church, please visit us online at www.passionchurch.tv. Now let's join the service already in progress. Well, it is so good to see you this morning as you're loving on each other, and uh, we're good to, it's glad to, we're glad to be home this morning. We uh, went to Wichita Falls and preached for our sister church in Wichita Falls on Sunday. 17 people gave their heart and life to the Lord on Sunday morning at Wichita Falls, and that's the day we're longing for here to see people surrender their heart and life to Jesus. Um, I don't normally do this, but I want to do this real quick this morning. Um, this, this is important, I, I think. Uh, some of you were not here Wednesday, and I think it's important for us to hear this and see this. Um, in about three weeks, we will be 11 years old as a church. Uh, a lot has changed in 11 years. Locations, times, people, uh, weight, hairlines, uh, all, all that kind of stuff. I ain't talking about y'all, I'm talking about me. But two things have never changed. And I want you to hear me this morning. Two things have not changed and will not change. The first is this. We are committed, totally committed to encountering God together. Uh, that's why our services, although we have an order for our services, we will always allow the Holy Spirit to take over. If we need to stick in a place, we'll stick in a place. That's why I'm doing what I'm doing right now. This wasn't on the agenda necessarily. But, but we are committed to encountering God I am still as convinced today as I was 11 years ago when we started that you can have as much of God as you want here. You can encounter as much of God as you want here. The only limit to how much you encounter God when we gather like this is you. It's not the guy with the microphone. It's not the worship team. It's you. Because we each determine how much of God we get. That's on you. Can't blame it on nobody else. Can't blame it on nobody else. If you don't encounter God, that's your issue. The second thing that we have always been committed to and will continue to be in, uh, committed to is this, engaging our culture. Because I am not satisfied with us coming in here and having Holy Ghost services with goosebumps, but nobody on the outside knowing it or, ex experiencing, or uh, experiencing it or having in, any impact on them. Listen, I, I, I'm telling you right now, this is not part of my message, okay? So y'all, this is for free. Uh, listen, 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 if you want to be a part of a church where you can just come and hide out and get your spiritual fix and then go home and not engage culture with the, that, then I give you permission to find a different church because this is not that church. I am more um, committed than I, I guess, I mean, I, I, I feel like I've always been committed to it, but I just sense it in my own spirit. I'm more committed to make you uncomfortable about being comfortable and apathetic to the fact that people are going straight to hell. We have to start, we have to do something about that. We, and so there are means and methods and ways, and we're, we've been committed to trying them all. We're still trying them all. We will continue to do those kind of things. Why do we do what we did Wednesday night and invest the amount of money that that kind of event takes, takes is because we are committed to at least opening the door for you to have an encounter with somebody so you can share the love of Jesus. How many of you know that people don't really care how much you know until they know how much you care, right? So you can tell them about Jesus all you want to, but if they can't pay their bills and they can't give their kids paper to go to school and they don't know where the shoes are going to come from and where the clothes are going to come from, that's an issue. And you can stand up and tell them about Jesus all you want. What they want to know is how can you help me get my kids to school. So on Wednesday, we, uh, we did the block party and uh, it was the biggest outreach we have ever done bar none bar none i'm going to show you some videos a video here in just a second just so that you get an, an idea of what happened on wednesday it was unbelievable i don't even think we were ready for it i think it will continue to be like that from now on uh it over 1400 people showed up on our property for help you say well all right, it's my birthday, so I'm going to take a little extra time than I normally do. Some of you will, will, would snicker and say, well, some of them are just gaming the system. I got it. I get it. You're right. Some of them pull up in BMWs, get out, smoke $19 worth of cigarettes, and then come and get $7 worth of school supplies and we're going to game in the system. Next week, they'll be at another one, and they'll get more supplies for free because they buy what they want and beg for what they need. 
I get that. But before you just throw them all in and throw the baby out with the bathwater, may I read this to you? This is what happened. Two, two testimonies. Uh, uh, from, from Wednesday. Uh, Madeline, I just wanted to share with y'all something cool from yesterday's block party. There was a mom sitting alone that I felt drawn to, so I asked her if there's anything I could get for her or help her with. She looked at me for a few seconds and said, you could pray for me. She proceeded with tears streaming down her face, tell, saying that she had lost her job on Friday and that her husband is an alcoholic. And she came and brought her little five-year-old boy to our block party because her husband was drunk and they needed to get out of the house. Our crazy block party yesterday was a safe place and a refuge for her and her son. And I can't help but to think that this was the case for quite a few others families, uh, quite a few other families too. Then we got a second one. Another mom in a very, uh, in a very long line yesterday just left court and hasn't had her son for 11 years. She has been wa- working hard to get him back and she's been drug free for over five years now. She left court with full custody of her son. He had been in foster care since he was a baby. She is scared to death that she can't financially provide for him, but is willing to do whatever it takes to do it. I told her about our pantry and our church, and, she, and even though she's scared to death, um, and I'm sure her son is too, they got backpacks with supplies and they left, and she said she was oh so, over, so overwhelmed and needed to leave, but she was thank, thankful that we had done this. Amen. That's what this is about. We are committed to that. So I'm going to show you a video of what took place on Wednesday, but, but I want you to understand what we're trying to do. Uh, at the end of September, we are going to do Heaven's Gates, Hell's Flames. I, uh, Danny will announce it and show you a little video. Can I, man, I didn't plan on doing any of this. This is my birthday. I'm going to do what I'm going to do. Um, <laughs> I hate stuff like that. Just honestly. I don't like dramas. Never have. Can't stand it. I was national youth director, and part of my responsibilities was to oversee the national fine arts stuff. I hated it. (laughs) Hated it. Uh, And it's not anybody's fault except for the fault of the fact that the church I used to work at used to do these big dinner theaters, dramas. And by the end, when they would do the, finally finish the presentation, they hated one another. Because they would get in fights, and because people that don't fish fight. Um, and they weren't really fishing because it was not evangelistic in the least. It was just a fundraiser. And so I, I came out of Greenville and I took, I told, same way with cantatas, because we did cantatas, we did all the cantatas. Had nothing to do with getting anybody saved. It was just so we could show off our voices and pray, sing about Christmas. So when we left Greenville, I looked at Julie and said, never again. No dramas, no cantatas, no nothing, nothing, nothing. (laughs) So I hate that kind of stuff. But when you look at me and tell, and tell me that, like for instance, Wichita Falls last year saw 138 people get saved, then I'm in. Even if I don't like it. Even if it comes off cheesy and it's the goofiest thing in the world. As long as people give their heart and life to Jesus, I'm in. We say it was going to cost $4,600 to do it that you weren't planning on spending. Yeah, I know. I know. We'll go in the hole if we have to. We went in the hole on the block parties. We go in the hole in the pantries most of the time. We go in the, all that stuff costs us money. I don't care. You say, why? Because it's worth it if one person gets saved. But we're trying to maximize what we're doing and see hundreds. I am expecting hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people to get saved. That's what I'm believing for. I need your help. We got to pray. We got to work. We got to do all that. But we are committed to seeing people's lives change. Would you roll that video and let's see what it looked like on Wednesday. It was nuts. I'll pray. Is it going to work, Teresa? Wait. 
Yes? No? All right, I want you all to stand up. We're going to go line up around the building because that's what it was like. All right, turn the lights back on. Tell. Um, there were literally, for over an hour and a half, well, first of all, people started lining up at 4 o'clock for a 6 o'clock event. And the line extended from here at the, the end of this building all the way around to this side. And it stayed that way until 8 o'clock. Haircuts were given until 10.30 at night. It was supposed to end at 9. It was ridiculous. We'll, Teresa, if we can get it at the end, we'll show it at the end, okay? Hopefully, we'll get it back. All right, so I'm just encouraging you. It's got, we've got to keep going on. All right, so get your Bibles out. No, bumper, no sermon bumper, so we get, we'll just go right on with it. We don't need the tech. We'll make it happen, all right? Get your Bible out and turn to Luke chapter 19. Luke chapter 19, and let me start out by saying this as we begin this new series this morning. Everything leads up to this. All the long hours, the early hours, the late hours, the exertion, the exhaustion, the sweat, the soreness, the taxing things that we do. It's called practice. Now, I know Alan Iverson didn't like any practice, but, but practice, uh, whether you like it or not, is an essential thing that you do. Athletes, young and old, they put themselves through some of the craziest routines and disciplines to get their bodies ready. I don't know if y'all have ever seen any of the crazy workouts some of these folks are doing now. There are some crazy workouts they're doing. Trying to get stronger, trying to get faster, trying to get their 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 skill honed and their ability just fine-tuned so that they can compete. And, and it's practice and they, they do it every day over and over and uh, drills and and. All this crazy stuff they're doing. And they do it for one purpose and one purpose only. Game day. That's the only thing that makes all the practice and all the crazy stuff and, and, and doing all these, this nutso stuff, that's the only thing that makes it worth it is, pri- is the game day. It's not practice. Nobody really like. come on, if somebody tells you they like to practice, uh, they're lying, I think. Because really what it's about is it's about game day. It's about walking into an incredibly packed stadium and feeling the adrenaline rush and feeling the overwhelming sensation of this crowd that's rooting for you. It's all about game day. That's what it's about. It's about game day. It's game day that makes all they do worth it. It's game day that allows the athlete the opportunity to discover whether or not they're really prepared or not. Because you really don't know until you get into game day. You think you know when you're in practice, but you don't really know whether you're really ready for game day until you get to game day and they blow the whistle and sound the buzzer and you start the game. That's when you know whether you're really ready or not. It's game day that shows and reveals the holes in your game that you need to work on, that you need to prepare. It is game day that makes the pains of practice disappear. It's game day. Now, the problem (laughs) that we have is this. In our society, most of us have become so unwilling to practice And to put ourselves through the disciplines necessary. That since we don't practice, there's this truth you need to understand. If you don't practice, you don't get in the game. Uh, That went over huge. All right, so. uh, But but we don't like practice. And so what happens is we, 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 what we've done is we want to skip all the hard work, but still be an expert. Okay, it's going to get tied up in here. So, uh, we, we, we don't want to go, we don't want to get the 4 a.m. call that gets us up to run the extra mileage that we need to, to do to get the base. We don't, we don't want to do the extra setups. We don't want to do the, the push-ups. We don't, want, we don't want to do none of that. But now, we, we, but what we think we are is we think we're experts from the stands. Haven't you ever uh, met anybody that has never taken a snap They've never thrown a pass. 
They, they've, they've never studied a playbook in their life, but they can sit in the recliner and they shout at the TV instructions to this coach that has given his entire life to this practice of making a team better and at these fine-tuned athletes. And we know what play ought to be called and why do you keep running it up the middle? And why did you run that pass? And you're an idiot and you're a bum. What's your, can't you catch the ball when there's 19 guys stretched all over you? What's, what's wrong with you? And we be, but doesn't that extend beyond just sports? Haven't you ever met somebody that has never balanced a budget? Never made a major decision about hiring or firing? Never had everybody else's uh, livelihood uh, wrapped up in the decisions that this one individual has to make? Never set any policies? N- never hired or fired? Yet around the water cooler, they are the expert. They know exactly, boy, if I was running this business, if I was running this show, if I was running this church. uh, What that's done is this. It has led us to a proverbial we. All right, so so we go to sports, like we'll go to the Thunder, and these guys that have spent hours in the gym, hours, like while you're asleep, they're in the gym. I know you think they're rich. I get it. I... Listen, come on now. (laughs) I get it, but listen, they're making the money because they spent hours while you were sleeping, while you were taking it easy. They were up making layups and jump shots and free throws. And we have turned into this proverbial we society. So now we'll go watch them play in the stands and we never step foot on the court and we never make a basket and we never get fouled. But if they win, we'll walk out of the arena going, well, we won that one. (laughs) Yes, we did. All strutting and proud. And then if they didn't do just quite like we thought they should, and they just kind of had a bad day, and somebody shot the ball when they should have passed it over and over again, (laughs) then we go, then we go, we lost. The proverbial we. The truth is, we didn't do anything. The the reality is, it's the people on the field. It's the people in the driver's seat. It's the people at the, in the big chair making the hard decisions that win or lose, that triumphed, that came up short in the stands, but we're convinced that we're in the game. I've learned some things about being in the stands. I know y'all don't believe it now, but I used to be uh, somewhat of an athlete. Uh, and now, I, listen, Daniel, I wasn't in your like your realm of athlete, all right? Andrew's brother's here, and he's, he just graduated from Virginia, played D1 football. I wasn't that kind of athlete. I was just a good all-around athlete, all right? Uh, I played baseball. I wrestled. I ran cross-country. I played golf. Uh, that is a sport, by the way. I uh, <laughs> played a little football. Uh, and then I had my own sons. And now, I find myself in the stands. I've learned some things about being in the stands. Yeah, boy. Yeah, boy, we're coming, because I'm coming for you right now. Because y'all, Julie doesn't like to sit by me in the stands. <laughs> y'all, y'all think I'm joking, but I'm telling you the truth. I've discovered, the truth, this is not my message, this is for free too. I've discovered that I do better at basketball games if I'm at the scores table. Because then I can't say nothing. Y'all think I'm joking. Uh, I'm better at baseball games if I'm in the press box. Y'all think I, some of y'all that have come to baseball games know that I'm the MC in the press box. There's a reason for that. It's because the windows are shut and the ump can't hear me. <laughs> y'all think I'm playing, but she knows. She knows. She knows. I'm like, y'all don't, some of y'all don't even know. I am so stinking competitive. Like, it is like... It, I, it's dangerous how competitive I am. And my boys bear the brunt of that. That's another reason I stand in the press box. And Okay, but I've learned some things in the stands. I've learned that in the stands, you can criticize or critique. Have you ever noticed that the players that are with their teammates every day in the gym or in their in the weight room with with their, their, their teammates working out. Have you ever noticed, have you ever seen one of these interviews where somebody asks 
about their teammates and kind of disparages them a little bit and talks bad about them and their teammate comes to the rescue and they get angry. Yeah. Uh, like, you know family can talk about family, but if you talk about my cousin, my sixth cousin on my grandmother uncle's side, uh, six generations removed, I'm probably going to cut you, right? Because family can talk about family, but if you're not a part of the family, then you don't have the right to criticize, correct? You got it? That's, that's true on teams as well. That's, what, that's why teammates jump into the, the, to the fray and they, uh, they I've, I've watched them, they almost come to, it's like they get angry. Because they've watched their teammate struggle and they've watched their teammate work and they've seen all the effort and they've seen all the energy and they've seen the game plan that they've set in offices and on the fields and talked through. And now you want to come along as an expert reporter that's probably never played a game in your life and you want to ask questions like you know something and they get mad. I've discovered that uh, it's easy to snicker from the stands. I've also recognized, especially in the la- over the last 10 years, I've seen this uh, in unbelievable form and, and seen it time and again that, that it, is, it has become accepted to make judgments from the cheap seats. We, we can be cruel from the crowd. The, the distance from the stands to the field causes us to feel safe in our critique. From the safety of our seats, we feel entitled. We feel enlightened somehow because we're in the seats to express our opinions and make judgments. That's true of sports. That's true of work. That's true of church. That's with no knowledge of facts, we criticize because we can. That's why one of the uh, one of the um, reoccurring themes for me over the last eleven years has been this. I didn't even plan on saying this either, but I'm going to say it right now. Don't come talk to me bad about Life Church. Don't do it. I don't have time for you. We're not going to do that. I haven't heard in a long time, and I'm thankful. We won't do that at this church. Are they different than us? Yes. Do they have a stated purpose and goal? Yes. I've heard Craig Rochelle himself tell us, tell me in a session I was in, he, he said, we know what we're good at. We're good for three years. We get people saved, then we expect the rest of you to take over and di- disciple them. Don't talk. I don't have the right to criticize just because I'm up in the stands watching. The second thing I've, I've recognized in the stands is this. You can root with no risk. We want, listen, I don't know about you, but when it comes to sports, I want my team to give every ounce of energy. I don't want them to leave anything in reserve. I want them to give it all. I don't want them to hold nothing back. I don't want them to coast. I don't want them to just throw the towel in. I, I demand every ounce of effort from them, and I want them in the weight room. I want them in shape while I hold my sugar water and my popcorn. I, I, I want them. To, I want them to watch their diet. I, I, I want them. I want them to develop. I don't want them to take a day off. But I've learned this: those who root have no requirements. We can root, but that doesn't mean we're taking any risks. We just walk in on game day. And we forget about the game until the next game. There's no risk in that. Uh, we, we don't have to prepare. We don't have to focus. We don't have to plan. We just want the game to be good when we get there. I want my team to be good when I get there. I want my worship team to sing on key. When I get there, I'm not going to think about it Monday through Friday or Monday through Saturday. But on Sunday, when I get here, my worship team at my church better be on key. It's been a privilege to have you join us for this time of ministry. To find more Passion Church resources or to make a donation online, visit www.passionchurch.tv. Remember, you can't live without passion. But I don't risk it. I knew it was going to be overheated this morning, so. Again next week. I don't know. I, uh, I don't want to make any personal investment. I don't want any effort. 
I just want it to be right when I get there. And when it's not right, because I'm just rooting with no risk, then I go back to point number one, which is I can criticize because it's safe from the stands. I didn't have nothing to do with it. As long as you get me a service on the right time, at the right temperature, with the right spirit, then I'm good, and you did your job, and I won't think about it for another six days, but then I'm going to roll back in. And then if it's not right, me and you are going to have a talk. All that to say this. I've also learned from the stands that in the stands, you don't really win. The stands are safe. And the stands are easy. But the stands are also optional. You can be late for the game. You can leave early. But it's optional. You're just in the stands. Okay. (laughs) In the stands, we might experience excitement, but you never experience a win. I, I just need to—I I need to break this to you um, this morning. Um, I don't care who your favorite sports team is, and I'm really struggling to preach this morning because some of y'all are wearing some Texas stuff. But <laughs> and y'all certainly don't know what it feels like to win. So let me just—I'm playing. I'm playing. I'm playing. I'm playing. I'm play- I had I, sucker punch. I knew it was coming. All right. So uh, I actually like Dallas, though. But anyway, uh, that's a different story. Okay. So, so I, I just need to break it to you. Whoever your team is, you're never going to get the trophy. You ain't never getting a ring. Not unless you go to the pawn shop and find one. You ain't never getting a ring. They're never going to throw a parade for you. You're never going to get the invitation to the White House because they won the championship. I know they're your team and we won. Yahoo! But you didn't win. You didn't win. To win, you got to get in. Did you hear what I just said? To win, you got to get in. You've got to get in. See, fear keeps a lot of us from getting in the game because we're afraid of the criticism or the risk. And most of us um, have had situations in the past where we've been hurt or we've experienced failure. And so we, we, we're, uh, we have this aversion to the risk necessary to get in. So we stay in the stands. And in the stands, we've never really experienced a win. We've even done this to church. I am concerned because what I see happening is, and it's not just our church, it's every church, we have turned church into a spectator sport. So it works like this. I show up, I pay a small cover fee, and then I come into a a, a comfortable environment, you take care of my kids, that's part of what I get for the fee that I just paid. You come in, I come in and I need you to sing to me. I'm not going to sing, y'all sing. And y'all worship... I'm just going to watch. And y'all preach, just make it short and sweet and don't step on my toes. And, and, and be nice to me when I get here. And then I'm going to leave. And if somebody else happens to share a testimony of their life being changed, radically changed, we go, we won. And we watch somebody else get a blessing and they experience encounter God. And it's like they're in the very presence of God while they're worshiping. And we go, we won! And the entire time, your life hasn't been transformed. And your sickness hasn't been healed. And your family hasn't been restored. But we go, we won. And the truth is, we didn't win nothing. They may have won. But we didn't win. Listen, I just came to tell you this morning that the fruit of winning comes from the seed that is planted behind the scenes. To win it, you got to get in it. I, I discovered, some of you are freaking because I haven't read any scripture and I usually start off with scripture, so I'm going to get there. Because what I've discovered is I begin to think back over Jesus' experience and encounters on earth. I discovered that Jesus, Jesus had this tendency to not let people stay in the stands. When He would walk and talk, He pulled people out of the stands constantly. 
over and over uh, with statements like this. Take up your cross. He made them make a decision. Follow, leave your nets and follow me. He's calling them out of the stands. He, he said things like, uh, uh, let the, bed, the, the dead bury the dead. He's calling them out. He's forcing them. To come out of the stands. Probably, and I, this is why I told you to look, turn to Luke chapter 19. Probably the most significant um, encounter that I could find uh, as I thought over this for the last couple months is the, the account of Luke chapter 19. Uh, this is one we sing about. If you grew up in church like I did, you sung about this one. We, we probably ought to stop and sing the song together right now. And you'll know where I'm going here in a minute. But in Luke chapter 9, it talks about Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus was a wee little man. A wee little man. Was he? Yeah, okay, I'm in the right place. All right, Luke chapter 19, listen to what it says. It says, as Jesus was passing through Jericho, a man named Zacchaeus, one of the most influential Jews in the Roman tax collecting business, and of course, a very rich man, tried to get a look at Jesus, but he was too short to see over the crowds. Maybe we want to stop singing that old great song, Short People Got No Reason. That was my theme song. No reason to live. So he ran ahead and he climbed into a sycamore tree beside the road to watch from there. And when Jesus came by, he looked up at Zacchaeus and he called him by name. Zacchaeus, he said, quick, come down, for I'm going to be a guest in your home today. Zacchaeus hurriedly climbed down and took Jesus to his house in great excitement and joy. But the crowds were displeased. He has gone to be a guest of a notorious sinner, they grumbled. Meanwhile, Zacchaeus stood before the Lord and said, Sir, from now on I will give half my wealth to the poor, and if I have overcharged anyone on his taxes, I will penalize my, I will throw the flag on myself by giving him back four times as much. And Jesus told him, This shows that salvation has come to this home today. This man was one of the lost sons of Abraham, and I, the, Mess- I, the Messiah, have come to search for those and to have such souls, to save such souls as his. I started thinking about this account, and I learned the song when I was a little kid. But I, I read it again, and I recognize this. Zacchaeus had no intention of getting in the game. None. All he wanted to do was see Jesus. He just wanted to get up in the stands and feel the excitement and the swell of the crowd, the adrenaline rush of seeing this superstar walk by, but he didn't really have any intention of ever getting into the game. In fact, I would submit to you this morning, please catch this statement I'm making right here because this is church in 2018 in a nutshell. I believe that really all that Zacchaeus wanted to do was gain perspective. He had no intention of gaining participation. I just want to come and pre- just watch. I just want to. I just want to rub shoulders with somebody that's getting their praise on. I just want to. I just want to be next to somebody that's getting a little bit of Holy Ghost excitement in them, and maybe some of it will rub off. I don't really want to participate I, because they're crazy anyway, and I ain't about to dance, and I'm not going to jump, I'm not going to shout, I'm not going to sing. I'm not. I just want to stand here and watch. I just. I just want to watch. I just want to get some perspective. I don't want to participate. I just want to get a good seat. And watch. I want to experience the overflow. I I, I don't want any personal involvement. I want no investment. But I'm just going to watch. Jesus found a man in the stands. And he asked him to get in the game. I want you to notice what happens when Jesus looks at Zach. And says, hey Zach, get out the tree. And I'm coming to your house today. He was safe. Listen. He was safe in the tree. He was safe in the stands. Nobody badmouthed Zach while he was in the tree. But as soon as he climbed down and got in the game, the Bible says that the crowd, the folks in the stands, got angry because it's safe to critique from the stands. 
And they begin to badmouth him. Well, Jesus is going to the home of a notorious sinner. Don't you know Jesus who you're dealing with? And isn't that what happens now? If we, don't we walk out and go, man, if you knew where so and so was on Friday night, you wouldn't have allowed them up here to do nothing. You wouldn't let them work as a greeter. Don't you know they were greeting on Friday night at the club and, and now they're in the game and I'm going to critique them because it's safe for me to critique them from the stands. I don't know the fact that they've been in a restoration process for nine months. And you don't know the fact that we took a microphone away from them because they weren't living like they should be living. You don't know that they've been in counseling. You don't know how far Jesus brought them. And all of a sudden, I'm, it's safe up here to, to criticize. Zacchaeus was safe. Until he got in the same. Listen, I just, I just wanted to tell you because the whole th- thrust and, and what we're drilling down this month is, is you got to get in. You got to get in the game. Some of y'all have sit and soaked and soured. You've been coming to church all your little life and you have made no investment. You've never gotten involved. You've never taken any risk. And I'm encouraging you to get in the game. Get in the game. All right. But I just need to warn you. If you're going to get in the game, you've got to develop thick skin. I also noticed something that I'd never seen in this account too. And that is this, that um, when, when Zacchaeus comes out of the tree and he goes to his house and Jesus is in his house, he didn't care what the people said. Never saw that before. It, it, like he didn't have to go on Dr. Phil's show and say, they talk bad about me, Dr. Phil. What am I going to do? My life is over. They don't like me. They made fun of me. He never did that. I, and I think it's because he was so focused on the fact that Jesus called him by name. That, that now, I'm so focused on that that I... Listen, you will know if you are serving and that you're in the, really in the game for the right reasons when what everybody else says no longer matters. Man, that's good. You know, that's how I check when my attitude is right about this church. Because I'm just straight up with you. There are sometimes my attitude is not right about this church. And it bothers me when people badmouth this church because they're talking about y'all. I've given my lifeblood for this church. It bothers me. I'm like, I'm like Russell Westbrook defending PG3 when it comes to you talking about this church because this, this is my baby. We've, we've given, so have y'all. I don't like it when people talk about our church. Not in a bad way. And I know y'all think I'm all holy and stuff. But I'll come off the top rope with an atomic elbow on somebody. <laughs> Y'all just don't know. But that's how I know whether I'm, I'm, if my attitude is right. Because if my focus is on the fact that Jesus called us and He planted us here and He's given us a commission to encounter His Father and to engage our community, then in, the, in those moments, my attitude readjusts and I, I begin to realize, listen, what they say don't matter. They don't know. They don't really know. They weren't in the strategy session. They weren't in. They haven't read the playbook. They haven't been at practice. They only show up on game day and they experience the overflow. They didn't get in here and make sure the air conditioner was working right. They didn't straighten the seats up. They didn't put the envelopes in the back seat pocket. They didn't. Have, well, they didn't greet anybody in the, in the parking lot. So if they want to bad mouth, let them bad mouth. Doesn't really matter. I'm not serving them anyway. I'm doing this because I get this chance to experience Jesus firsthand. Some of y'all are scared to death to serve because it makes you a target. I, I just need to tell you, as soon as you come out of the stands, you will have a gargantuan target on your back. And if it's not some other church person, it will be a spouse. And if it's not a spouse, it will be your kids. And if it's not your kids, it will be your co-workers. And if it's not your co-workers, it will be a classmate that you haven't seen for 62 years. But all of a sudden, they will blast you on Facebook and go, I knew you when you were in high school. And now you're serving at a church like you're all holy. What difference does it make? 
I don't care what they say. Zach recognized that having Jesus in his house was worth the price that he would have to pay. And I am just telling you this morning that we can tell whether you're serving for the right reasons when the cost never really concerns you. Have you ever met some of those people, I, I've met a few in my day, that they are martyrs about serving? I can't stand that kind of folk. Like, like, like they, they're, serving, they're serving, and the whole time they're serving, they're complaining. I got, I got work. Man, come on, why am I here? Why, can't, I don't know if I want to be an usher today. I got so much other stuff to do. I, I just, uh, it, it's, such a, it's, such a, it's such a challenge for me to get up and be here. Do you know, I, have you ever met anybody like that? They serve, but they, the whole time they're serving, they're talking about, it cost me this, and it cost me that, and this was so hard, and this was, then I just want to ask them, Why? Why are you even doing it? Because you're apparently not doing it for Jesus. Because Zach said, look, man, Jesus is in my house. I don't care what y'all say. Jesus is in my house. And I just need to encourage some of you to get to that place where you don't really count the cost as long as you're doing it. For, you don't, you don't, listen, if you're doing it for Steve, you're going to complain about doing it for Steve. Because, listen, Steve don't always say thank you as often as Steve should say thank you. My, and my leadership team said, Amen. My boy said, amen. My wife said, I, I, I don't always stop as often as I should as your pastor and go, I'm so proud of y'all. I am. But I'm also a self-starter. So I don't need a lot of people to tell me you're doing a good job. I know when I've done a good job and when I haven't. So I'm not very conscientious of what. But so if you're serving because of me, you're going to complain. If you're going to serve because you, uh, of one of the team leaders, you're going to complain. But if you're serving... Because of Jesus. Then you'll never count the cost. I, I, I'm almost done. Y'all getting, y'all getting tired on me. So, so this is what I know. Uh, um, it is as you serve. Listen, please. It is as you serve. That you truly see. Zacchaeus saw Jesus. Then he got called out of the stands and he saw Jesus. Some of y'all see, but you don't really see. That's deep. Some of y'all see, but you don't see. Because the only way you actually get to see is to get out of the stands and to get in the game. If you look at the text, I want you to notice, I, I, um, uh, we are not saved by works. Please don't misunderstand what I'm getting ready to say, because I know some of y'all going to, because it's safe to critique from the stands, I know what you're going to say. You're going to say, he said, it's going to be on Facebook this afternoon, my pastor said, you can work your way to salvation. That's not what I'm saying. We do not work our way to salvation, but because of our salvation... We work. So then, if you look at Scripture, and I didn't write it, so don't get mad at me. But when Zach got out of the stands, Jesus said, salvation has come to his house. But we twist that too, because we forget why he said salvation came to his house. He worked. He said, listen, I'll give, I, because you're here and not, because I'm out of the stands right now, I'm going to give away half of everything I got. And not only that, I'll throw the flag on myself. And if I mess up, I will penalize myself and give four times as much. And Jesus looked at him and said, salvation. He didn't work his way to salvation, but he worked because he's saved. Right? And so I just want to encounter you this morning, uh, or challenge you this morning, that, that it, you will never really experience the level of salvation. Oh, no, here you go, CC. I'm going to get tweeted on that one too. Pastor Steve talking about levels of salvation. No, come on now. Stay with me. You're mature enough. This, this series is for us, right? You're mature enough to understand that there are no levels to salvation. If you're saved, you're saved, right? But you're never more saved than when you work. 
and serve. Okay. I thought you were, okay. So, so what I'm saying this morning is simply this. I'm just going to say it real blunt and then I'm going to quit. No more tree huggers. Safe in the stands. Going to critique when you don't know the backside. No risks. Just make sure the game is good when I get here. No investments. Get out of the stands and serve. Take a risk. And if you take a risk, ta-da, you see. I know you thought you were seeing because you showed up here faithfully every week for the last 1,600 years. And you thought you were seeing. But if you didn't work and you didn't invest and you didn't serve, then you did not see. The moment you begin to serve Him... Your eyes will open and you will see. So I'm encouraging you this morning. Quit playing it safe. Exit the stinking stands. Because we're going to start talking about victories around here a lot. Like the block party. Like Heaven's Gates. Like some other things that are going to happen. We're going to get up here and say, we won. And some of you that have never served are going to go, we won. No, you didn't. If you ain't in the game. You ain't winning. And so I'm going to challenge you. In your seat this morning, there's a little card that says, Exit the Stands. I want you to pick that card up. I want you to look at it. Here in a moment, I'm going to pray. And then Danny's going to come and close us, and he's going to give you instructions on what to do with this. And hopefully our media is working by then. We'll get to see all the block party stuff too. Okay, good deal. On this little card are most of the ways that you can serve at our church. Not all, but most. There are a few that are not, but we tried to get most of them. I want to encourage you. Some of y'all been here a long time. And you've been in the stands a long time. If you're hurt, listen, listen. If you're hurt, and you're broken, and you've been used, then please, please sit We've never had a problem with people walking in hurt, broken, discouraged, allowing them to sit and be restored and to be renewed. We give you permission. My question is, is how healed do you have to be? Because some of y'all got healed a long time ago. (laughs) And there comes this moment where we become Zacchaeus in the stands going, oh, I'm going to watch from afar. It doesn't work that way. We've got to serve. If we are going to be able to handle the harvest that God is going to send us our way, we have to all get in the game. So in this, on this card, there are um, a variety of ways. All we're asking you to do is if you're not currently serving, circle. Pick one of them. I don't care which one. If you can't sing, please don't select worship. If you hate kids, please don't circle kids. But if you don't know, then by all intents and listen, if you think you're a quarterback, circle it. It's not on there, but stay with the metaphor. If you think if you think you're a quarterback, circle it. We'll find out if you're a quarterback, and if you're not, we'll help you transfer to the. Uh, maybe you're a linebacker. Come on, right? Yeah, like maybe you think you're like an NBA superstar, but we discover that you're better at like catching the ball when other people shoot and throw it back to them so they can shoot again. <laughs> That's called a ball boy, by the way. <laughs> but that's okay. We will Listen, you may circle something on here and discover that you're horrible at it. That's okay. As long as you get out of the stands and serve, we're okay with that. Because we want you to see. Here's what's going to happen, just so you know. Pastor Danny will talk to you about where to put these in a second. I'm going to pray over them, and then you're going to, I'm going to give you a second to fill them out. But this is what's going to happen. When we get these cards back, and we are going to get these cards back, um, okay, just seeing if you're with me this morning. Um, we're going to divvy them out to the team leaders, and within 48 hours, they're going to call you. Call you. So don't be putting fake numbers down, because they're going to call you. All right. They're not going to bother you, but what they are going to do is say, hey, we saw that you signed up for this. This is what we want to do. We want to sign you up for your first serve. So that you will be teamed with a host, somebody on that team that knows what they're doing. And the first time... They, they'll arrange the date, the time, they'll tell you what time to be here. And you show up and they will walk you through. They will do on-the-job training so you'll know how to get in the game. 
That's all we're asking you to do. That's all we're asking you to do. If some of you have been on the sidelines a long time, it's time to get in the game. Father, in Jesus' name, I pray. Uh, first of all, let me just do this, Jesus. I thank you for a group of people that let, will let me whip up on them. These are the best folks. And they're patient with me. And I'm thankful. Father, I think that the reason we're this way is because we all really desire to grow spiritually. We want to mature. We want to become more like you. I want to grow up in you. And so I'm willing to be disciplined for that purpose. And so I'm thankful for this group of people. Father, I pray for this group that's here under the sound of my voice this morning. There are some folks here that have been like Zach. They've been up in a tree and they've been in the stands and they've been watching for a long time. And they claim victories, but they've never really experienced any for themselves. I pray this morning that as they exit the stands, as they come down and get involved... I pray that what would take place is their eyes would open and they would see. Father, if there's anyone in this house that's been serving for the wrong reasons, I pray that you would adjust our sight and our perspective and we would begin to realize that we're serving you. We're not serving a pastor. We're not serving an organization. We're not serving uh, any of our team leaders. We are serving because of you. So let our perspective be correct. But Father, for those that are not serving, I pray that all the fears of risk and all the fears of being a target and all the fears of being critiqued would diminish right now and we would see you. And when you call us by name, we would count the cost and recognize that it really doesn't cost anything if it gets me to Jesus. And Father, I pray that you release a great army of volunteers out of this house today as we prepare ourselves for a great harvest over the next few months. I just pray that you would position us with servants' hearts and we would get in the game call us by name in Jesus name amen come on turn to your neighbor right now and say to win you got to get in come on tell it's been a privilege to have you join us for this time of ministry to find more passion church resources or to make a donation online visit www.passionchurch.tv remember you can't live without passion Welcome to Passion Church. For more information about Passion Church, please visit us online at www.passionchurch.tv. Now let's join the service already in progress. It has become a spectacle. Uh, it's an event, uh, and at times it seems to rival the hype and the excitement of the production of Super Bowl and World Series all wrapped up together. These, th there's this rabid craziness. People line up. They stand in line to get to this thing. They, they, they paint their, themselves from head to toe. They put on their favorite team gear. They hold up signs, and I've never understood it. I, uh, I'll just be honest with you, I've watched it a little bit and I'm like, what's this all about? Because it doesn't make any sense to me because nobody scores any points and nobody wins any trophies and nobody gets any uh, major victories, but, but there's this fervor and this fanaticism and, and, and I just haven't figured it out until recently because recently I read a statistic that blew me away. 
I discovered that in 2018, uh, there are 480,000 athletes that will compete in NCAA Division schools. 480,000 people, young men and women all over America will go to college or are in college right now and they will compete as an athlete and go onto the field and go onto the court and, and all these different things and they will compete. And out of those 480,000 students that are competing in college level athletics, only 1,210 will be selected in this year's draft. Let that sink in. Out of 480,000, only 1,210 will be selected in this year's draft. That That is, uh, for all of these, for to play professional sports in football, women's basketball, men's basketball, football, uh, ice hockey, and men's soccer, all combined, 1,210 will be selected out of 480,000. When I read that statistic, it made me suddenly realize just how big a deal draft day really is. In the lives of those students, certainly, but also in the existence of the team that is selecting them. If out of 480,000 athletes, only 1,210 are worthy to compete at professional levels, then what that says to me from a team standpoint is that my selection is extremely important. Are you all with me? I mean, you, that, that makes sense then. Then I can understand the rallying. I can understand the amount of study and the amount of resources and the amount of energy that are exerted around this moment where I'm picking a particular player for my, spa, my, my squad because I recognize that I have a very small opportunity to fix any holes. I, I, feel I have to uh, deal with any deficiency in my team. I need to improve the strength of my team. And so suddenly when you recognize that the pull is that small and that specific, then it becomes extremely crucial. Draft day is important. There's a lot of potential with draft day. There's also a lot of risk. How many of you have been watching the draft before and seen somebody get picked in the first round and they bomb? They, they never come through, right? They never come through. And so, uh, so it's important. So last week I told you that it was essential for you to get into the game. This week I want you to go one step further with me. I want you to turn in your Bible to Luke chapter 5. I'm going to read a very uh, familiar passage of Scripture to you, but there's a draft that takes place in this account, and I want us to look at it. In Luke chapter 5, beginning in verse 1, we're going to read down through verse 7. This is what it says. It says, One day as Jesus was preaching on the shore of the Sea of Galilee, Great crowds pressed in on him to listen to the word of God. And he noticed two empty boats at the water's edge, for the fishermen had left them and were washing their nets. Stepping into one of the boats, Jesus asked Simon, its owner, to push out into the water. So, and so he sat in the front in the boat and he taught the crowds from there. And when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Now go out where it is deeper and let down your nets to catch some fish. Master, Simon replied, we have worked all night. In fact, it says we've worked hard all night. Right? That's what it says. All of last night we worked hard. And we didn't catch a thing. But if you say so, I'll let the nets down again. And this time their nets were so full of fish, they began to tear. A shout for help brought their partners in the other boat, and soon both boats were filled with fish and on the verge of sinking. It's draft day. It's draft day. There are a lot of lessons I can teach you out of this account. I want to just mention a couple, and then I'll get to the idea of the draft, because I think there are a couple things that we need to learn from this account first. The first one is this. Excuses hinder execution. Y'all quiet on me this morning. Y'all worshipped, worshipped out, now you're tired, huh? Uh, excuses hinder execution. I want you to notice what it says. It says that Jesus commandeered their boat, and then Jesus 
tells them to do something that makes absolutely no sense. It's during the day now. I know some, most of you have never been to the Sea of Galilee. A good group of you are getting ready to go in November and you will experience what I'm talking about right now. You recognize that in the middle of the day is not the time to go fishing in the Sea of Galilee, especially with nets. Because now in the mid-morning or middle of the day, whenever he's there talking to them, the, the, the water is so clear, crystal clear, that if you drop nets... The fish see the nets and they avoid the nets. So Jesus is telling them to do something that makes no sense. And they do it anyway. All right, so, so, so no sense. So, so may, may I uh, just remind you of something that I've said over and over to you again. Just as a side note, I want to say it again to you this morning to make sure that you get this. And that is this. Miracles always occur on the other side of obedience. Okay, well, I'm going to keep saying that probably for years to come until we get it. Miracles generally occur on the other side of obedience. So in other words, we often, stick with me here, we often get no harvest because he gets no obedience. And our reasons for not obeying are numerous. They're called excuses. I'm tired. I've, I'm fatigued. I've tried this before. I've done what I know to do. I've taken matters into my own hands. I've, I've worked the system. I, I've done all I know to do. I've turned to everybody I know to turn to. I've prayed all I know to pray. I've worshipped all I know to worship. I've sung all I know to sing. I, I've done all I know to do. And we make excuses because we grow tired and we grow weary in, in well-doing and we come up short. And what I'm trying to tell you this morning is that is the condition that Jesus found these men in. They were tired. They had worked all night long. They had failed. They had dr- done all they know to do. They, they were expert fishermen. They did their best and they still came up short. And it would have been reasonable for them to make excuses. Excuses hinder our execution. Too many of us allow what we've gone through, the failures of our past, the efforts of our past, to cause us to make excuses. And because we make excuses, it hinders execution and we don't run the play. Next week we're going to talk about the playbook. But, but we will never run the play if we make excuses as to why we cannot run the play. But something interesting happened. Simon says, you know what, Lord? Master, whatever you say, I'll do it. What's your excuse this morning? Why can't you do what God has told you to do? Why can't you accomplish? Why can't you try one more time? Why can't you sign up one more time? Why can't you serve one more time? What excuse do you have that's hindering the execution? Because if it hinders execution, it hinders the miracle that God wants to produce in your life. So, so... No more excuses. The second thing I want to just draw your attention to here is, is I want you to see a truth. It says that, uh, I'm going to do it in Steve Ely version, that the, the, the disciples in boat number one catch a ton of fish. That's what happens. Boat number one, notice they catch a bunch of fish. Okay, some of y'all never fished in your life, so this isn't helping you, so I'm going to try to help you right now. There is a difference between catching a bunch of fish and landing a bunch of fish. Because a lot of times when you talk to people and say, well, how many fish did you catch? They caught it, but then it got off right as it got to the boat. Anybody experience that? That's no fun. I like to fish, and that's no fun at all. The big one always got right up to the boat, and then it gets off, right? Always. He was this big when he got off at the boat, right? So there's a, so you need to understand. Yeah, okay, so some of you have been around fishermen before. There, there is a difference between catching and landing. All right, disciples in boat number one catch a ton of fish, but they haven't landed the fish, all right? So probably, I can't prove it, but probably this is like the record of all time that they'd ever caught. You know how I kind of come to that conclusion? Because after this catch, they quit. You've got to understand how fishermen think. You've got to understand... That if I've caught the biggest fish, like if I catch a 12-pound bass, I'm done. I ain't never going fishing again because I know I'm never going to catch another one that big. If I go and catch this many fish, this is like record-breaking. I recognize I need to stop while I'm ahead, right? So that, that's probably what's happening. So, so all of that to say this. Please catch this this morning. The number of hands determines the size of the harvest. That's really good. Even though I wrote it, I'm telling you, it's really good. All right? 
Because here's the conclusion I've reached after I've read and read and read and read and read this account over and over and over and over again. This is the conclusion that I have come to. If there had been no help, then there would have been no harvest. Because it says two things. It says it was sinking their boat, number one. And number two, it was tearing their nets. And it wasn't until they called for help that they were able to not just catch the fish, but land the fish. So, so it wasn't until they increased the number of hands that they actually secured the harvest. So what does that mean individually for us? It means this, is that uh, too many of us catch a miracle individually, but we can't keep the miracle. We catch it, but it never lands. Okay. I'm telling you that corporately, we can pray for a miracle. But often God will give us the miracle, but we don't keep the miracle. And I've come to the conclusion in both cases, whether it's individually or corporately, the reason we're not able to keep the miracle is because there's not enough hands helping us to secure the harvest. I am preaching this morning. Some of y'all looking at me. Uh, I want to say it like this. A multiplied harvest requires multiplied hands. I have learned something in my life. I have learned that most of the time you will receive a miracle in private. But it will require numerous hands to keep what you got by yourself. Okay, y'all don't have to help me now this morning. Some of you trying to help me, some of you ain't. I I just recognize this morning that a miracle often manifests in isolation, but it is almost always managed by many. I can prove it to you. I can prove it to you just like this. Some of you have been set free from alcohol or drugs. And have you discovered that even though you individually received the miracle, that it requires other people around you To help you to manage the miracle that you received in private? Okay. And and, and haven't you seen... uh, You get a spouse? All by your little lonesome? I mean, you're the one that bought the flowers and took them out nice places to eat and loved on them and wooed them and made them ignore all your bad habits and all of a sudden you gain a spouse... But haven't you figured out that even though you did that individually, it takes a whole bunch of people to help you walk through and to avoid the landmines that would cause that relationship to rupture? That's what we're talking about right here. We're talking about the fact that, that, that you have to have enough hands to manage your miracle. Since we're talking about game day, I'm going to say it like this. You may win one play all by yourself. But to win the game, you got to have help. So, so what am I saying about us as a church? What I'm saying about us as a church is that we can pray for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people to get saved through the ministry of this, this church. But I've come to this realization. We can catch them, but we can't keep them if we don't have enough hands. We can pray that our church's uh, ministries like OERT, like, um, like uh, the Passion Co- Closet and com- uh, Pantry and, and the Block Party, we can pray that the, that the influence of those ministries will continue to expand and we will impact our community. And we can pray, oh God, we had 1,440 people at the Block Party or something like that. It was, it was craziness. And now we're praying you give us the wisdom how to expand it. And I've recognized that the size of the harvest has to be matched by the number of hands. There comes this point where you can't handle any more harvest if you don't have help. Uh, why is that important to know? I, I think it's important to know because I, I just uh, I, I recognize something else about this account that I've never really seen before. I, I've recognized that because uh, you do gotta, you've got to put yourself in the story. These are fishermen. Right? These aren't doctors out there fishing. These are fishermen. Like they make their living. When they catch fish, they make their living. They're at work. Okay? So this is their job. They're at work. And they are ble- Listen, when you're a fisherman and you catch and land a bunch of fish, that's a good day. 
Because how many of you know there were probably, well, you just read it, the night before, depending on the Sea of Galilee to provide for them, they caught diddly squat. Nothing. They went empty-handed. That means they were at work and they didn't get paid. They worked all night long and didn't get paid. All night. That's not a good day fishing. Right? So I, I, I got I to gotta, I gotta get you in this story because you recognize now that they, we would use these terms. In, in our day, we would say this. When, when they encounter Jesus and Jesus says, throw the net on the other side and they start pulling in, the net starts tearing, it's about to sink their boats. You know what, they would, what we would say? They were blessed. Right? Don't, How you doing? I'm blessed. How was your week? Blessed. How's your relationship? Blessed. Right? That's what we say. We're blessed. So let's put it in our terms. They were blessed. This is what I recognize out of this story that I've never recognized before. Their blessing almost destroyed them. Okay, so you say, well, what difference does that make? I, I've, I just read it, and it says that their boat begins to sink. Uh, they're, they're out in the deep. I could talk to you about the fact that uh, Israel is not like America, where on Labor Day weekend everybody will go to the lake. In Israel, especially in this day and age, in this scriptural account, in the setting, the, the context of what we're reading here, the Israelis were, a, they thought water was the abyss. Listen, when you go to Israel, there's nobody on jet skis. I'm serious. We'll go to the Sea of Galilee. There's nobody out there except tourists on a boat thinking they're crossing the, red, the, the Sea of Galilee like Jesus did. It's unbelievable. It's a beautiful lake. There's nobody there. Nobody's skiing. Nobody, nobody on jet skis. It's ridiculous. They were afraid of the water. They're in the deep. And the water, or the boat, begins to sink. But they were blessed. Listen, their blessing almost destroyed them. This is what I've come to the conclusion. That God is a good God. I'm going to say that one more time because i got no help right there. And you should have said amen, all of you that have been blessed. God is a good God. Okay, I thought I was in the right room. He wants to give us the desires of our heart. He will bless us when we ask Him to. But without help, the blessing that He gives you can destroy you. Haven't you heard somebody pray this? Oh, God. Please, God. Grow my business, God. I need you to... I, I need you to... Give me a promotion. Give me, give me a raise. Give me, God, please, 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 please. Give me, haven't you heard? And God is so good that he sends a bunch of fish and he blesses you. But haven't you seen the same person that's prayed that then become so overwhelmed by the blessing that they've received that now they're so stressed out that they start doing crazy stuff? And they get distracted and they quit going to church and they quit worshiping and they quit reading their Bible and they quit pursuing God. All because the blessing has overtaken them and they, they couldn't handle it. Okay, I'm going to try to get right down to where you live. Haven't you heard someone say, oh God, I need a relationship. I'm so lonely. I'm lonely. Everybody else on Friday night is out partying. I, I know they are. I, I know nobody ever stays at home. They're all out partying every Friday night. It's like, it's like roses and hot baths and, 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 and it, fancy meals. And they come and open the door. Oh God, send me a relationship. Then they get one. And they lose their mind. And they lose their way. You know why? I, I've, I've figured it out. You know why? The business overwhelms us. You know why? The relationship is too much for us to handle. You know why? Not enough help. Not enough hands for us to be able to deal with the very blessing that we cried out to God, please bless me, please bless me, bless me God, bless me God, bless me God. And God is so good, He goes, okay, I'll bless you. But He expects you to ask for help to handle the blessing. Jesus produces miracles. That's what Jesus does. He produces miracles, but He expects us to draft people to manage the miracle. That's good. Right there, I'm going to say that again. Jesus produces the miracle. You don't produce the miracle. Jesus produces the miracle. He does that. But he also expects us to draft a bunch of people into our life to manage the miracle. We, see, um, so i got to ask you, 
Who in your life is helping you manage your blessings? Who? Because if you don't have someone, you might land the, or catch the blessing, but you'll never be able to land the blessing. It won't stick. You'll squander it. You'll lose it. Here's another question. Who are you helping manage their blessing? Instead of being jealous about their blessing. Instead of ignoring their blessing. Instead of talking about them because they were blessed. Instead of standing on the sidelines watching them squander their blessing. We've got to have a draft day. We've got to get in the game. We've got to step up and say, I will help you manage your blessing. We need to have a draft The disciples had a draft day. Here's where I'm going to land this morning, and then I'm going to stop. The disciples in boat number one conducted a draft day. I'm going to read it to you. Here's draft day for the disciples right here. We call them disciples. They're not disciples yet. They're just fishermen. The fishermen in boat number one, realizing that they've been blessed beyond measure, realizing they can't manage this blessing by themselves, they have a draft day. Here's what happens. This is what it says. And this time, their nets were so full of fish that they begin to tear. A shout for help brought their partners in the other boat. Did you get it? They shouted for help. Another version says it like this. They waved to their partners. Another version says, and they signaled for help. They recognized their need for assistance and they let it be known. So in other words, we must give or get the signal. I'm going to help you right here. I want to ask you this morning whether or not you're giving the signal. Okay. What are you saying? Because... I didn't know Drew was going to say what he said. It's the working of the Holy Spirit. We're right on here. There are some of you in this room that feel like you're on a boat out in the deep and it's starting to sink. And you won't signal. It may even be that you would, you would testify right now and say, I'm more blessed than I've ever been in my entire life right now. But the truth is, is I'm sinking. Some of you, that's not your testimony. Some of you would say, I'm not, I don't feel like I'm blessed. I'm just going through so much turmoil and so much trial and so much pain and so much hurt that I'm sinking. I'm going, to, I feel like my world is crashing in around me. I don't know, I'm at wit's end, I'm in pain, I'm heartbroken, I'm, I'm desperate, I, I'm depressed, I'm disillusioned, I'm, 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 I'm angry. I'm, and you won't tell nobody. Won't say a word. And we, we walk in on Sunday morning and people look at us. We go, how you doing? Oh, I'm great, man. It's been a great week. And you're lying. Lying. In the house of God, lying. Lying on your Facebook. Lying on your Twitter account. Instagram is a sham. You're putting all these great images out. And you won't ever tell anybody, hey, I'm sinking here. Help, 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 help. Please help me, Lord. You won't tell nobody. Nobody. You suffer in silence. You know, this is what happens. Isn't this what happens? This is what happens. We walk around like that. We're all saying we're blessed. And then all of a sudden, one Sunday or one Monday or one Tuesday, somebody disappears. They disappear. They literally disappear off the face of the planet. We can't find them anywhere. They're not at church. They're not on Facebook. They're not calling us anymore. We can't find them anywhere. And we go, well, what happened to them? I thought they were blessed. And the entire time they were sinking and they wouldn't say a word. And some of you in this room are in that position right now. You're sinking. You're sinking. You're sinking. But you won't signal. Conversely, may I say to you this morning that everywhere we go, coffee shops, restaurants, places of employment, places of education, the mall, Everywhere we go, there are people signaling, shouting for help. And some of us never pay enough attention to know that they're going down. And because we don't pay any attention, harvest 
is lost. And I just want to challenge you this morning both ways. If you're here this morning and you say, Steve, I'm going down for the last time, then please, by all that's holy, please, you're in a safe place, signal somebody and say, I, you're going to have an opportunity at the end of this service. I, I need help. Please come up. But some of you need to wake up and realize that there are people around you screaming for help. And while you're being blessed, they're sinking and they need help. It's draft day. I just want to know if you're watching for the wave. Are you tuned into the signal? It's draft day at Passion. We're trying to signal you today. We're trying to tell you that we're, we're, we're shouting for your help. We're, we're drafting you. We, we're trying to tell you that out of all the people in all of Oklahoma City, that the hundreds of thousands of people of Oklahoma City, that it's draft day and you're one of the 1,210. You've been selected. You're, you're one of the chosen ones to come and be a part of a team that's about to gain a harvest, but we've got to have hands to land. We, we need you to fill gaps. We need you to fix deficiencies. You're the one that will turn the tide and you'll help us to win more than just the game, but win the victory that God is for us. And I don't want you to miss the signal or, or we miss our opportunity and we'll just catch something, but we won't be able to land something. So this is what I want you to do. I want you to take the little card in your hand this morning. We're going to do this different than we did last week. This morning, this is what I want you to do. On the back of this card are quite a few ways that you can get plugged in here at the church. It's not all the ways, but it's a good number of the ways. ways. And uh, I think we're just going to conduct a draft this morning. This, this is not a trade. You don't get to trade somebody off your team you don't like. It's, this is a draft. We're, we're recruiting people. We're literally signaling that we've got to have your help, that we need you in the game, that we need you to take part. Take this card in your hand. I want you to turn to your neighbor right now. I want you to take this card, put it in their hands and say, I am drafting you. I need you to get in the game. Why, hey, if you're, a, you're one of, you've invested so much time, and some of y'all have invested a lot of time and energy and resources and the person sitting next to you, hand them a pen, make them sign it. Uh, we're just asking you to just try it. Maybe this is a, come on, hand it to somebody. Don't sit there with that card in your hand. Just turn and try to draft somebody into the game. We want you to fill it out. And here in just a moment, when the offering plate goes by, we're going to give you an opportunity to drop this in because we need you to get into the game. We are headed into the fall. We are headed into the fall. Julie, if you get somebody. If we're, we're, we're headed into the fall. Do you understand what I'm saying? We're headed into the fall. I know it's hot right now, but we're headed into the fall. In, in church world, come on, stay with me now. In church world, fall is crucial. The nets will begin to be filled this fall. At, at not just our church. Churches all over America will begin to see things fill up at the fall. We're, we're doing Heaven's Gates, Hell's Flames at the end of September for the purpose of spreading the nets. But I'm telling you this morning, to have a multiplied harvest, you've got to have multiplied hands. We're signaling. You say, well, I can't do much. Excuse. I'm tired. Excuse. I've already served. Excuse. I'm not very gifted. Excuse. You can't open a door? You can't smile and wave? We need you. So it's draft day. So have you turned to your neighbor? Have they filled out the card? Make check them. You can't draft them if they hadn't signed up. I mean they, they gotta they gotta clear waivers right here. They got you gotta sign up right here. Some of y'all don't know. They got, you gotta sign up. So make sure they signed up. This is what I want you to do. I want you to stand with me this morning. I am convinced this morning that under the sound of my voice there are people that haven't signaled 
you've been keeping your pain to yourself. I, I'm convinced that in a crowd this size there, size, there are people here this morning that have been accustomed to silence. They become accustomed to suffering in silence. And they never signal. They never raise a hand. They never shout. They never signal and tell anybody they're hurting. And week after week, month after month, come into a place like this when people ask you how you're doing you say you're blessed but you're drowned and I wish we were more in tune and I wish we were more aware and I wish we were more discerning but the truth is is that most of us have become professionals at faking it so nobody really knows and for all of the good intent and all of our desire to help because I know the people here I know we got people here that want to help I know we do I know we do we got some of the best people in the whole world man they rally to, to tragedy they rally to heartache they rally I've, we've never thrown anybody away I've, I've watched people say I need some help and you think it would turn them off and they think man I don't want to be no every time that's ever happened people have rallied. So I know we got people that help, but here's the truth. We're so good at faking it that we don't know. We don't know. So this morning, what I'm giving you the opportunity to do before we transition into clothes and before we do a, a, a baby dedication, all these other things that we, we, we're going to do, but, but before we do that, we would be remiss if we didn't give you an opportunity this morning to signal for help. To be honest enough, say, I, I'm about to go down. I, I, it, listen, I just, can I be the first? I just tell you, it's been a stressful weekend already. Donna stopped me at the door. I, I must have not been faking it very good. Miss Donna caught me and she said, are you all right? I was like, no. been a stressful 24 hours. You say, well, uh-oh, something. Yes, come on. What stresses you out probably wouldn't stress me out. What stresses me out probably wouldn't stress you out. It's just something to stress me out. But I need somebody to recognize the sickness. Donna, continue. thank you, Miss Donna. It helped. Are you honest enough this morning to say, that's me? We won't think less of you. There ain't nobody going to be sitting back in their pew right now getting their Facebook going out. Oh, you wouldn't believe who went down to the altar today. I thought, I know they must be hooked on drugs. They, they must be sleeping around. They, 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 they've been like, they've been dancing on the side, making extra money. They ain't doing none of that stuff. But that's not what's, listen. It doesn't even have to be stuff like that. It can be, it's just been a hard stinking week. Tired. Kids are crazy. Send them back to school, Lord, please. It could be my car's not right. right. My, I don't know how I'm going to pay my bills. I'm tired. you're here this morning and you say, Steve, I need to signal this morning. I, I need to I need to be the one to wave. I need to be the one to shout. I need to be the one to ask for some help because I feel like I'm going down for the last step. If that's you quickly, will you step out? Will you be brave enough to signal and trust the people around here to know them well enough to know that we won't judge you and we're not going to make fun of you. We're just, we're going to rally around you because we've all been there. We want you to be able to get your harvest and keep it. But it's going to take hands. It's going to it's going to take a lot of hands. It's going, to, it's going to take some hands. It's going to take some hands. Drew, down here. I'm stressed out too. I know it. I know it because he told me. He signaled. There's nothing wrong with that. They just, they just had a baby. They ought to be stressed out. They were stuck with that little boy for 18 years. He's going to drive him crazy. They're going to love him with everything. And then he's going to drive him crazy. I've been there. I know. Right? It's a stressful time. 
Some of y'all starting back to work. Man, if you aren't stressed out about your kid going to school, you ought to be. Have you seen what's going on in our schools? we got great teachers, but it's a tough environment. Some of you are facing life decisions. Do I want to keep, do I want to stay in this job? Should I marry so-and-so? Should I keep dating? waiting because I think there's some more. Will I ever get to sleep all night long again? Alright, here's the deal. This is boat number one. Is it necessary for me to tell you where boat number two is? Boat number two. All those of you there that everything's great reminding me on business and all of a sudden a cry goes up. The way you start. I gotta have I gotta have big hands. You sit there on the shore and leave your neck and act like it doesn't have any no concern to you. But if you do that, you got some friends up here that would have some fish to share with you. But they're gonna lose the harvest. If you don't step up. I'm asking you right now, step out. If, it, if, 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 you, if you see the signal, it's our responsibility to respond. If you see, if you hear the, if you hear the shot, if you see the wave, if, now I gotta respond. I'm gonna get a hand on, so I know they're not by themselves. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not by themselves. If they're not by themselves. I, I may not know what to do, but I'll, I'll rally, I'll rally, I'll rally. Come on, would you get your hands on them right now? Would you begin to pray? Would you begin to pray? We need to. Uh, I'm a helping them. I'm, I'm a helping them. I'm, I gotta help them. I'm gonna help them. I'm gonna help them.
Jesus' name. Come on. Father, we pray blessings on these folks. We pray that you would bless them. We pray that you would bless them, bless them, bless them, bless them, bless them, bless them. Do what only you can do. Do what only you can do. Do what only you can do. Bless them. Bless them, bless them, bless them, bless them, bless them, bless them. Let their dreams come true. Let their dreams come true. Let the harvest be gathered. Let the miracles take place that they long for. But now, Father, this is what I pray. We know you produce the miracle. That's your part. But our part is we surround them. We step up. We rally. We help them secure the blessing that you've given them. And so this morning, Father, I pray not just for the people that came down and said they were in a desperate situation or they feel like they were drowning. I pray for all of us around them that we would rally, shake us, remove our apathy. If they lose their harvest, we lose. And so, Father, I pray in Jesus' name right now, you would help us, help us, help us to rally to the signal for help. I pray we wouldn't just pray for them this morning and then go get in our car and go home and forget about the need that was expressed. I pray that you would place deep in our spirit and in our heart right now, you'd give us a burden for the person that we prayed for and we would pray for them all week long, all month long, all year long until their harvest is secured. So, Father, I pray that those that came down would feel encouraged and that they would feel like the world looks like it's better and like they can make it. But I also pray for those that responded to pray. I pray that you would give us a burden to help. And that burden may look different for some of us. For some of us, it may just be prayer. For others, it will be phone calls. For others, it will be an offering to them. For others, it will just be hanging out with them. For others, it will be a multitude of things. But I pray that we wouldn't become so hardened to the needs around us that we would just go home and go back to business as normal. Our fellow fishermen signaled for help. And I pray that you would challenge us this morning. Cause us to respond. Not just today, but a continued response. We ask you to do this in the name of Jesus. Help us to land the miracles that you have for us. In Jesus' name. Now, will you do this? Will you turn to one another real quick before you find your way back to your seats? And I just want you to say to each other, you can signal me. Come on, tell them. Now, don't tell them that if you're not willing to respond. You can signal me. You can wave and I'll come and help. You can shout and I'll come running. been a privilege to have you join us for this time of ministry. To find more Passion Church resources or to make a donation online, visit www.passionchurch.tv. Remember, you can't live without passion. Welcome to Passion Church. For more information about Passion Church, please visit us online at www.passionchurch.tv. Now let's join the service already in progress. Well, everybody has practiced and prepared. They've gone through all the scrimmages. They've sweat. They've hurt. And now it's time. 
the, the draft has secured all the missing components to address any deficiencies on their team. And now the referee stands and he takes the whistle and he blows and he drops his hand. And the game has started. It's game day. The crowd rises in anticipation. The clock begins to tick down. And now we're right in the middle of the game. They, the crowd rises up. They swell with anticipation. I know some of y'all are crazy. You start throwing things at the TV. You're all excited. You, okay, so you're not that crazy. So, so the game started. I've discovered that you can spend hours and hours in preparation and going through the routines of practice. And you can go through the draft and get all the players that you need. And this is what I've discovered. You can have the very best athletes in the world all on one team. And you can still lose. You can still lose based on this little deal right here. Everybody has to know the playbook. Right? Because if you don't know the playbook, if you haven't mastered the playbook, then what happens is the coach begins to watch the game unfold. Y'all know the guy on the sideline isn't the one watching. It's the one way up in the press box, up in the coach's booth, and they're watching, and they're seeing what's happening, and they see the defense shifting and moving, and so they, they want to call because they see the gap in the defense, and they've got the one perfect call that they know it's going to score every time. But if everybody doesn't know the playbook, they can't call the one play that it would expose and capitalize on the weaknesses of the defense. Right, John? This is the way it works. Yeah, see, John knows. If only the quarterback knew the play. If only the running back knew the play. If only the wide receiver was on the same page. There there was a huge gap, but I couldn't call the play because they didn't have the playbook mastered what i've discovered is is that if you don't know the playbook then the advantage swings to the opposition and you're stifled in your ability to score so let me just summarize it like this and say that the playbook is essential for victory the playbook is essential for unity the playbook is the standard because see this is what can happen it, it, you can run a play and maybe even gain some yards, but the coaches will go back and they will review the film and they will will judge the play against the standard, which is the playbook, because the playbook exposes the fact that not everybody knew the play, so this is what happens. There are people out of place. There are people that are out of sync, not where they're supposed to be. And in fact, did you know that teammates can even get in each other's way? And okay, so so you got to know the playbook. So so I believe that after this is the third week of, of, of game day series, I believe that we're getting real close to having all the right players in the right places. All right. All the teams are starting to start and flesh out a little bit. Now, you, there's still room for you, but we're, we're getting the right players in place and on the field. So if that's true, then it is absolutely essential then for us to make sure that we know the playbook. So I want to take you to the playbook. Join me in Luke chapter 9. In Luke chapter 9, I'm going to read to you verses 1 through 5, and then I'm just going to read uh, Luke chapter 10, verse 1, and we'll talk just a minute about that uh, and and see if we know the playbook. Here's the playbook. uh, Luke, Luke chapter 9, verse 1 through 5. When Jesus had called the twelve together... He gave them power and authority to drive out all demons and to cure diseases. And he sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. And he told them, take nothing for the journey. No staff, no bag, no bread, no money, no extra shirt. Whatever house you you enter, stay there until you leave that town. And if people do not welcome you... Leave their town and shake the dust off your feet as a testimony against them. One version in that little part about no bag, no money, no extra shirt says this. Don't load yourselves up with equipment. Keep it simple. You are the equipment. That's, that's good right there. I, mic drop. I'm done. All right. We are, we are the equipment. Uh, so, so that's our play. Right? That's our play. I'll come to Luke chapter 10 in just a second. That's the playbook. In fact, uh, if you want to get really down in the playbook, all you need to do is you can then begin to read in Matthew chapter 10 and Mark chapter 6, and what you recognize is that Jesus repeats the play. 
He calls the same play again to his disciples. He says the same thing, and he repeats it, and he repeats it, and he repeats it. In fact, I'm going to read to you just the first snippet of Luke chapter 10. I want you to go read it on your own uh, because it adds a little, a little bit of information. In Luke chapter 10, in verse 1, now they've gone through two weeks of play, a game day, all right? They've been passing out the little cards, and their team is swelling because he starts by telling the 12 to play, but now in Luke chapter 10, the team has grown to 72. And he turns to the 72, and he repeats the same exact play. He says it like this. I'm just going to read verse 1. He says, After this, the Lord appointed 72 others, and he sent them out two by two ahead of him to every town and place where he was about to go. I'm not going to read the rest of it, but then he says the same stuff. Go to the town, find a man of peace, If he offers peace to you, let your peace settle over him. Don't take a bag. Don't take a shirt. Don't take money. Don't take staff. Go and proclaim the kingdom. Cast out demons and heal the sick. He just repeats it all over again. That is our play. That's it. Okay, so I didn't read it out of like a paper Bible. Oh, see, look here. Even in electronic, look at that. I don't know what that, that shows you, but... It's in red. (laughs) He highlighted it for us. That is our play. Here it is. Go everywhere preaching the good news. Cast out demons. Cure diseases. Heal the sick. Stay focused. Refuse distraction. Don't get weighed down with materialism. And bring peace into every place you go. That is... The play. That's pretty clear. That's pretty concise. It's hard to misunderstand. And yet, I have to ask you this question. Are we running the play? Oh, I knew it would be quiet up in here on a Sunday morning. Are we running the play? That is the question. Are we doing what we were instructed to do? Notice he didn't instruct the church. Because we always want to blame it's, it's the church's fault we're not doing all this stuff. These are individual, individual people that he's instructing. Come on now, wake up. He's, he's saying, he's, bur- he's, he's drilling down to the individuals. And he says, this is your play. This is what I'm calling you to do. So my question is, are we running the play? Are we doing what he said to do? Are we taking any territory? Are we walking into places and, and, and sickness disappears when we walk in the room? Are we walking anywhere where people are distressed and overcome by demons and we're able to cast them out? Are we going anywhere proclaiming the good news of the kingdom? Are we running the play? And so there's a logical conclusion because if the answer is no, then the logical conclusion that I've come to is this. We, we, are, we are going to run a play. So if we're not running the play that the coach is calling, then the logical conclusion I've come to is we're running our own play. (laughs) So we're we're, going to always run something. So if we're not running the play called by the coach, then we must be running some play, and most likely most of us call an audible. And we're going to talk about why here in just a second because I'm going to help you. But we think we, we got this figured out. We can do it better on our own, and we run our own play. The only dilemma is, is that when we run our own play, we don't accomplish what the play would have accomplished that the coach called. And I don't know about how Coach John operates, but I think I do know how that, because I've seen him coach. If you don't run the play that the coach calls, the coach might just bench your hind end. You might get to spend a little pine time. You might not get back in the game. You know why? Because the next logical conclusion is this. If you don't run the play that the coach called, we don't win. You don't gain victory. You don't take territory. And the coach will not be pleased. And if the coach is not pleased, guess who he... Okay, never mind. Because this is... I'm trying to help you to understand that we are blessed when we operate in obedience. And when we don't operate in obedience, we're not blessed because the coach cannot put up with rebellion. And so we must run the play. I want to submit to you this morning that we will never really be effective as a team. We will never take the territory that God has uh, given to us if we're not running the play that he told us to run. 
So this is what I want us to do. I, I'm just getting started, but I, I, I just want us to stop right here as a, as a group of individuals who have been instructed to run the play. I want you to ask yourself the question this morning, am I running that play? And if the answer is no, then what I want us to do real, just real quick is I just want us to stop just a moment and I want us to talk to the coach and repent to the coach and say, Coach, I promise from this point forward, I'll, I'll run the play, bro. I mean, I'll run it to a T. I'll do just what you ask me to do. And I, I'm just asking you to put me back in the game and give me a shot. Would you join me, Father, this morning uh, as individuals that make up a corporate body? We repent this morning of taking matters into our own hands and thinking that we know better than you. And we, we repent for throwing the playbook out and running our own play and Father, we, we, we just ask you this morning, we repent, we, we, Jesus, we say, we heard what you told us to do, and, and, and even though it's, it seems like an overwhelming play, and at times it may not feel like we're ready for the play, Father, we just declare this morning that together we repent, we ask you to put us back, we promise, we'll do our dead level best, we'll do our best, coach, put us back in the game, we, we, we say together this morning, we make we make a proclamation in our own heart and our own life. We'll do our very best to run the play that you've called. We ask you to help us with this in Jesus' name. So he calls the same play over and over again. I, I can see Jesus stepping into the huddle, and he calls it like this. He says, all right, guys, here we go. Two by two. Power up the middle. Peace. Go right. Provision, go left. And persistence, just hang out here and camp right here. All right, are you ready? That's the play. Ready? Break. And then he releases them to go run the play. And they come back, and he calls it again. And he calls it again. And he calls it again. Uh, so, honestly, I think the playbook makes us nervous. Anybody else nervous when a preacher stands up and tells us we ought to be going somewhere preaching and going somewhere and casting out demons and going everywhere you go, you ought to be curing diseases and, and healing the sick. And Does that make anybody else uncomfortable, a little nervous? I think I figured out why. Can I help you this morning? Because I'll be honest with you, this playbook makes me nervous. But I just want to stop one, one second and just ask you this question just to whet your appetite. What if we really ran the play? What if all of us really made this, this dedication and applied ourselves and ran this play. Can you imagine what the body would look like? Can you imagine what our community would look like if we all really ran the play? It'd be all, okay, so let me help you. So, so why don't we run the play? Uh, the first thing, Tari didn't even know I was going to say this, but he was right on, bro. You were right on. Here it is. We don't run the play a lot of times because we don't understand these things right here. Number one, we aren't supposed to run the play alone. Okay, I know in Luke chapter 9 that I read to you, he doesn't mention it, but in all the other accounts, and then in Luke chapter 10, he follows it up, and in every one of those, other than the one I read to you, he makes Jesus, the coach, steps into the huddle, and he says, go two by two. Don't go by yourself. Don't run by yourself. Jesus understood that we would struggle to run the play if we're isolated and alone. Does this sound like a repeat? Does, it, does, does, does anybody that's been with me uh, three years ever heard us talk about not doing life alone, life together better? How many ways can we say it over and over again? Basically, we're calling the same play over and over again. And yet, we continue to live all by ourselves and we don't run the play. You were never supposed to run this play alone. You need somebody to block for you. You need somebody to clear the way for you. You need somebody to watch your back. You need a wingman. You need somebody to lean on. You need somebody in lockstep with you because we're stronger together. You are never supposed to run this play all by yourself. So what I've discovered is this, is if I read the play and I'm all by myself, I most likely won't run the play because I'm too weak when I'm alone. 
I know my own weaknesses and my own deficiencies so well that I will step back and I won't run the play. But when you're with me, when I got a, when I got a buddy with me, I, I'm braver than I was. I, I'll do some stuff that I, come on now, some of you guys have done some stuff that you would have never done by yourself because you were with somebody else, all right? I know, I saw the video on Instagram. I saw the, I, okay, so when we're together, we will do stuff that we wouldn't do all by ourselves. You're braver when there's somebody with you. Is braver a word? Yeah, is, is it? I don't know. It is today. You're braver when you got somebody with you. All right? I'm stronger. when I Because there are days. I'm, I know y'all think I glow, but come on. And I do sometimes. But uh, uh, I, there are days I don't have all the faith I should. But when I'm with you, don't you feel so stronger on Sundays? You know why? Because we're together. So you got to find somebody that you can run to play with through the, throughout the week. That when you're ready to go to work, maybe you, nobody else in our church goes, goes to the same job you do. But maybe you ought to call somebody right as, before you walk into work in the environment that you're walking into. And you, you know it's going to be a tough day because of the environment. Why don't you pick up the phone and call one of these teammates and say, can you pray with me right now? I want to go in and I want to proclaim the gospel. And I want to heal diseases. And I want to cast out demons. And I want to do all this stuff. But I, I'm all by myself. And they go, Oh, no, you ain't. I got you, bro. We're going to pray right now. We're going to pray right now. And together, there's strength. You cannot run this play by yourselves. I just want you to know you can't tackle everything by yourself. There, there's, this, there's this thing that happens in football. It's called gang tackling. John knows this. I, I keep referring to John. John's the head coach of Bethany High School football team, and he knows this. You want as many people to, to arrive at the ball at the same time. I don't, I don't want anybody on an island. I don't want my safety on, out here all by himself. When the ball comes through the line, I want six guys tackling him, not one, because if it's just one, he might break it and go for a score, right? But if there's six of us hanging all over that little scrawny dude, he ain't going nowhere, right? That's what we, we want you to gang tackle. The enemy. You cannot do this by yourself. So I need you to touch your neighbor and say, are you with me? Come on, ask him. Are you with me? Are you going to get in the game with me? Come on. Are, are you going to? I need you. I need you. I need you to clear. I need you to make a hole for me. I, I, I need you to watch for me. I, we got to have each other. Second thing I got to move on is this. For the play to work. If for the play to work, we have to know how to run the play. All right, y'all missed it, huh? For the play to work, we got to know how to run the play. So I started reading, and I look back. I just stumbled on this. I, I, I'll do this occasionally. As you're reading passages, you ought to back up so you get the context. And I backed up into Luke chapter 8, and I began to read, and I discovered that we got a great coach. Because in Luke chapter 8, Jesus runs the play to show the disciples how it's supposed to be run. A good coach will always do that in practice. He'll, he'll take the, I mean, they're struggling with the play. He'll go, give me the ball. Takes the ball. And he said, all right, we're going to go half speed. Ready, set, hut. All right, I'm going to back up three steps. And when I back up three steps, I need the running back to take two steps into the left and then break to the right. I need my right guard to swing around and clear path. I'm going to begin to roll this way. And as I do, the tight end, I need, come on, tight end, get over and let me show you. I want to take two steps forward, and then I want to cut across. And he walks it out for them. He shows them step by step. That's what Jesus did in Luke chapter 8. In Luke chapter 8, we read that this is what he did. He goes and he preaches the gospel in Luke chapter 8. He drives the demons out of a man and casts them into a pig, into the pigs. Doesn't this sound like the playbook? Then he heals a woman with the issue of blood. And then he raises the man's daughter from the dead. He is literally step by step showing us the play. So that they would know how to run it. So Jesus shows us how to run the play. But do we know how to run the play? I, I, I want to show you. Jesus, the coach, after showing them the play, he calls the play in Luke chapter 9, and then he tells us once again how to run the play. Here it is. Are you ready? He says, do this with power and authority. That's how we run the play. Okay, y'all looking at me like deer in the headlights. Okay, here we go. I'm going to help you this morning. We are supposed to run the play with power and authority. 
Okay, y'all still not excited because we don't know. Jesus looks at us and says, run the play with power and authority. And we go, what does that mean? Okay, I'm going to help you this morning. The best illustration I've ever heard to define this and, and to try to explain this is, is this. It's the idea of a police officer. A police officer has two items with him. First, he has a gun, and then he has a badge. Power and authority. Okay? Because here's the truth. If he comes to your house and knocks on your door in the middle of the night, he doesn't have to have power. He's got authority. So when I see the badge, not when I see the gun, when I see the badge, I'm going to open the door. In fact, if all I see is the gun, I'm probably not opening the door, and I'm going to my nightstand. Y'all, y'all will figure that out in a minute. All right? But when I peep through the window and I see the badge, he's got authority. And so I open the door. All right, okay. So, all right. I'm going to help you right here. Both components are crucial for him to be able to carry out the responsibilities of his job. He has power and he has authority that has been invested in him by a sovereign. A government has looked at him and said, you now have authority to use your power. Okay, y'all still lost. So, okay, all right. So, here, this is the deal. Police officer's out just minding his own business. He's not even on duty. And he pulls his gun and and shoots somebody because they cut him off in traffic. All right. He's going to go to jail. He used his power for something that he didn't have authority to use it for. Okay, so, so, uh, so, okay. Even though he had power with no authority, his action is illegal. Right? Okay, so now here's where it gets real. So what's Jesus saying to us when he says, this is how you run the play, with power and authority? Okay, first of all, let's deal with power. How do you get power? You plug in. There always has to be a source for power. These lights came on because they're connected to a source for power. So you have to plug in to get power. And our relationship with the coach determines how much power we have. So in order to run the play, we've got to have power. And we gain that power. We access that power by plugging in with our coach. You got it? That's where our power comes from. But with power, if you don't have any authority, the power won't stick. That's why Jesus in in Luke chapter 10, the 72 come back and they begin to brag about their power. And they say, it's this incredible. We got so much power that everywhere we go, demons, they they obey us. And and devils, they run out in front of us. It's, It's unbelievable. We got so much power. And Jesus said, he stops them and reminds them that power alone is not enough. You also got to have authority. And he says, that's not even what's important, that demons and devils know who you are and they obey you. What's important is that you know that your name is written in the Lamb's book of life. And what he's saying is this, there's this thing called authority. The one who has the ability to save souls and has all the authority of the universe and is sovereign above everything, because you know him, you have authority, and that causes the power to stick. Okay, so so our ability to run the play is contingent on shooting power through authority. How do you get authority? Authority comes from your understanding of your status or your position in Christ. I'm in Christ. I got news for you. I don't have any authority of my own. I only, y'all look like y'all are lost. Can I help? Come, I'm trying to help you because we know the play. We just don't run the play because we don't know who we are in Christ. My, the, the only authority that I have the ability to use is the authority that has been vested into me by a sovereign. And so I go out and I proclaim things and I say things and I do things not backed by my authority but by his authority. And Jesus says it like this. Please listen to me if you don't get anything else I say. Please get this this morning. He says, you have the legal right. You have the authority. You have the authority to do these things. You missed it. You have the authority to do these things. 
The reason we don't run the play is we are trying to use authority for things that we're not supposed to use authority for. So let me help you. He says we have the authority to drive out demons and to cure diseases and do all this stuff. We want to use authority for other things. Let me, oh, please, listen. You have the power to sleep with whoever you want to sleep with. But you don't have the authority. You have the power to go out and get addicted to drugs, but you don't have the authority. Oh, some of you are getting this. You have the power to worry. You have the power to take matters into your own hands. You have the power to, to be rebellious. You have the power to steal. You have the power for all this stuff. But Jesus said, you don't have the authority to do all that. So if we can ever get our power lined up with our authority, then we have an impact and we can run the play. Can I tell you this morning that our power is backed up by who backs us up? And so this morning, I, I just need to tell you that, that he will give us authority when he, un, when he understands that we won't try to steal the authority. That I'm not trying to do all this stuff for my own, for my own benefit. I'm not going to try to take the glory. I'm not going to try to draw attention to me. He will lend his authority to me. He will vest his authority into me and then let me have power. If he knows, I will use it for the things that it was, we're called to use it for, to run the play. So what does that mean? It means that a lot of us can't run the play because we're missing one of the two key components. What it means is this, I'm challenging you this morning that every Sunday morning when you get back here together that you've got to plug in. You cannot come to service after service after service and go through the motions and expect to walk out of here with enough power. You've got to plug in. You cannot go through the motions and let them worship for you. You've got to plug into the source of power. So then you also come to a realization that while we're together, who we are. So that now I've got power in my life and I'll walk out with a partner that's going to help me. And we, we operate in authority. And we run the play. Listen, you cannot rely on your status as his child but never plug into his power. And you can never just walk out and operate in power if you're not hooked up with the authority. It takes both. Are we clear? You've got to have power and authority. You get the power by plugging in. You get the authority by understanding who you are. And then last but not least, please, I'm so excited about this point, I'm going to preach myself silly if y'all don't help me. Because we miss this. For the play to work, for the play to work, we must prepare. And you say, okay, wait a minute. I don't know about this passage of Scripture you read. It's, a little, it's wrong. Because I've read in the Old Testament that the Bible says that the Lord goes before us. And now in Luke chapter 10, Jesus flips the script and says, you are to go to the town before I get there. Go back and read it. I, I'll go back and read it because some of y'all ain't going to. He appointed 72, sent them two by two ahead of him to every town and place where he was about to go. Wait a minute. Scripture says God's supposed to go before us and now you're telling us we're supposed to go before God? That's what he did. He commissioned his disciples to prepare the way of the Lord. Okay. So, the, the, the players are supposed to go into situations and prepare it for the arrival of the coach. So, if that's the play, and you're not seeing the coach show up, can I make a logical conclusion? If that's the play, and the coach is not showing up into your situation, could it be that you haven't prepared the situation for the coach to arrive? 
Okay, y'all, some of y'all are struggling with me this morning. God's made it clear in Scripture. Now Jesus plays, calls this play, and he makes it abundantly clear that God, the coach, arrives, operates, and inhabits prepared places. So what does that mean? We, we are tasked with going to prepare the place before Him. What does that mean? It means that we have the responsibility of representing Him in such a way that, that, that when and we lay the groundwork so that when He arrives, people recognize Him. Okay, y'all not nearly as excited as I was about that myself because what that means then is this. It is my responsibility where I work And it is my responsibility in my neighborhood. And it is my responsibility in my school. And it is my responsibility of where I shop to walk in on a regular basis and prepare the way of the Lord. So that now this is how it works. I operate in peace so that when the Prince of Peace shows up, they recognize him. I operate in justice so when the righteous judge shows up on the scene, they suddenly go, I think I know who that is. We, we operate in business by, by operating in the light so that when the light of the world walks into my business, they don't go, well, who is that? They go, I think I've heard about you. I don't understand this, but you're different than everybody else. Why are you operating in the light? And as you go to work every day and operate in the light, one of these days, the, the light of the world is going to walk in on them and they're going to go, bingo, I know who you're talking about. We operate in relationships in su- with such grace and mercy that when we're walking through the relationships of life when the friend that sticks closer than any brother finally shows up in their situation they recognize him so what i want to say to you this morning is this is you can't expect him to show up in places where he has consistently been misrepresented Some of y'all want him to show up at your job, but you've represented him so bad that if he walked in, not only would they not recognize him, they wouldn't want him. Oh, that came back at me. Some of us keep expecting Jesus to show up, and the thing is, is he has, but they don't recognize him, and they don't want him because they've been watching the players that went before the coach. You say, you can't prove that scripturally. Yes, I can. Join me in the Old Testament. Let's just talk about old Nebi for a minute. Old Nebi, you know Nebuchadnezzar? The Bible says there were three Hebrew children that lived different than everybody else, and they built this gold statue, and he said to bow down, and they wouldn't bow down. And so King Nebi got mad, and he made this big furnace and heated it seven times hotter, and they throw the three Hebrew children in, right? They're in there. They've got to be burning up, right? I mean, it's the hottest the furnace has ever been. He grabs the guys that helped him build the furnace. They walk over to the edge, and they look in the furnace, and he says, I don't see three men, I see four. That's important, but this is even more important. He describes the man he sees. He says, I see a fourth man, but he looks like the son of man. Now, wait a minute. Nebuchadnezzar is an absolute, verified heathen. He has no relationship with God at all. He, he's not a believer. He's never bowed his knee to Jehovah. He's, he, he has no concept of who God is. And now all of a sudden, I'm going to go peer into the furnace. And there's four of them. And the fourth one looks like the Son of Man. How would he know? How would a heathen king ever know that that fourth guy looks like the son of the man, son of man, except for the fact that three Hebrew children had prepared the way of the Lord in such a way and represented God so well and showed, showed him over and over, this is what God looks like, this is what God looks like, this is what God looks like, that now a heathen king can peer in and even though he has no relationship, go, that looks like God. I think I recognize him. I don't understand him. I'm not even sure I like him. But that looks like God. If some of us would represent Jesus at the level that we're called to represent him at work and at school and in our neighborhood, then when we declare the kingdom of God, then when we cast out demons, then when we produce healing, they would go, I don't understand how this works, but I've got a glimpse of what the coach looks like. So now the coach has shown up in my situation, and I want to know him. 
at the end of September, the 1st of October, we're going to do the presentation of Heaven's Gates, Hell's Flames. And I want to tell you, we can put all the banners up in the world and we can hand out all the tickets and put posters up. But if you don't prepare the way for the coach, they can come and watch this drama and it could be really cool and it could impress them, but they won't recognize him if you've misrepresented him. So I'm asking you over the course of the next month, make sure at work that your language represents him. Make sure at school that your attitude represents him. Make sure when you go get in a line and they, they, they take too long to get your food, that, that, that your behavior represents them. Make sure that in your dating relationships, in your married relationship, in your friend relationship, if you're representing him so well that when you hand them the ticket and they come and watch a drama because you say, it's my debut, I'm going to act, they show up and instead of recognizing you, they recognize him and they go, oh, I think he's the coach and I've seen him, I've seen him work in the life of the player and I, I'm going to submit my... Run the play. I, I, I wish I could get you in a big old huddle right now and I would say, here's the play. Preach the gospel. Go everywhere and without being distracted. Make sure that your mind and the spirit is focused on Him. Don't get caught up in materialism. Go into places and cast out demons. Go into places and heal the sick. Go into places and be consistent. Bring peace bear onto that situation. When they're walking in chaos, you walk in the room and peace settles on the room ready set break and all of us two by two walk out of here and we run the stinking play that's the play that's the play that's the play no other place called that's the play Grab your little card. We're asking you to get off the bench, get in the game, and run the play. But you were never supposed to run the play alone. On the back are multiple plays, places that you can play. Some of you are running backs. Some of you are quarterbacks. Some of your defensive players, there's a place for you. I need you in the game because we can't play, we can't run the play unless we all know the play. So this is what I want you to do. Look at your neighbor and say, it's time for you to run the play and I need you to run the play. Get your pens out right now and if you haven't signed up, just for a second, just for a second before we pray, just for a second, just for a second before we before we pray, if you're not in the game, would you grab a pen quickly and write your information down in circle? You say, I'm not sure if I'm a running back. I don't know if I'm a quarterback. Just circle one. We'll find out quick enough. And if, it's, if that's not your position, this is how we operate out in, in, in this place. We're not going to send you back to the bench. We're just going to move you to a different position. And all of a sudden, we're going to keep moving you and moving you and moving you. And lo and behold, we're going to hit the right place and you're going to be a stud. And in that place, you will do things that nobody else could do. And in that place, you will help us take territory and gain yardage and defeat the enemy. In that place, we will help you find your place, but we can't if you stay on the sidelines. The coach has given us the play. I want you to stand with me. If you've got that card, I want you to just hang on to it here in a second. Pastor Andrew is going to tell you what to do it, with it. Here's the admonition I want to give you. If you're standing next to someone this morning and you know they're not serving, they're not serving at all, they're, they're not in the game. Before Pastor Andrew gets finished here in a moment, I, I want you to look at them and say, I need you to serve with me. I need you to serve with me. I can't do this by myself. I need you to serve with me and recruit them to the team. Father, this morning... My prayer is simply this, that we would run the play. God, under the sound of my voice are people that know the play, or at least we think we know the play, but we've been hesitant to run the play because we've been nervous. And I'll admit, Father, I'm nervous a lot of times when I think about what you've called us to do. You said 
that we would do greater things than Jesus did. That's scary to me. Because I try to do them by myself. So, Father, this morning I pray that you would lock us up with someone, that we would find a a running mate, a, a partner, a teammate, a wingman. Somebody that we can lock arms with and be braver and stronger and more determined. I pray that no one in this room this morning would walk out and feel like they're all by themselves. God, I pray that we'd break down any barrier that we think would keep us from doing that. Some of us are standing here right now and say, nobody lives near me that goes here. Nobody works where I work. Nobody goes to the school I go to. Father, I pray that you'd break down all those excuses and we would be intentional about finding people to run the play with and we would reach out to them and we would begin to call one another and text one another, private message one another, and together we uh, we would lean on one another for support and courage and faith. God, I call again for the play in our own spirits as a as passion church made up by individuals. I pray right now. We, we've heard the clarion call. The, we've, we, we've heard the play repeated over and over and over again. It's not going to change. It's the same play. And so, Father, over this congregation, I pray that we, everywhere we go, we would operate in power and authority. God, I pray we would not walk out of here with power in our spirit, but not under authority, because we know it will never stick. I pray that we would walk out of here knowing who we are, but we would also have the power to intervene in situations. Marry the two. Help us to gain power every week that we gather together. May we get more and more and more power, but I also pray we would come to a greater understanding of the one that has given us the power. Help us to operate in power and authority. I pray we would begin to use the authority and the power that you've given us for the things that you've given given them to us for. I pray that we would begin to go everywhere and doing it with grace, doing it with mercy, no condemnation. I pray that everywhere we go, by our attitudes, by our countenance, by our talk, by our walk, by every aspect of our life, we would represent you well. And by doing so, we would be proclaiming the gospel, the good news. We would begin to see people healed. We would begin to see people set free. We would begin to see chains fall off of people. We would begin to see those kind of things happen. That's what we have the power and the authority to do. May our peace settle everywhere we go. And last but not least, Father, I pray this. I pray that in the coming month you would help us learn how to prepare the way for you. I pray that every morning we would wake up with one task on our mind. Today, I am going to represent the coach so well that when the coach decides to show up, that everybody around me will suddenly recognize him. Even if they don't have a relationship with him, they will recognize him because they've watched me. Because they've watched me. Even if I'm in the fire, I represent you so well that they recognize the coach. I pray, Father, that as we do this, I pray that we would see hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people saved and set free, join a team, take territory, accomplish incredible feats for your kingdom and for your namesake. And so together this morning, we give all the glory and all the honor and all the praise to the coach, Jesus Jesus, Jesus, you're our coach. You're our coach. We've got the best coach. We've got a coach that will go out and run the play and show us how. We've got a coach that will lay his life down for us. We've got a coach that will sacrifice everything for us. Jesus, we we give you glory. We give you honor. We give you praise. We, We are thankful for our coach. And we're thankful that you let us play the game. 
Help us, I pray, in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Would you do this with me right now? Would you turn to two or three people and say, get in the game. Come on, get in the game. Get in the game. It's been a privilege to have you join us for this time of ministry. To find more Passion Church resources or to make a donation online, visit www.passionchurch.tv. Remember, you can't live without passion. Welcome to Passion Church. For more information about Passion Church, please visit us online at www.passionchurch.tv. Now let's join the service already in progress. In, in a track, they ring a bell. You're on your last lap. It, it happens. It's inevitable. It's just a matter of time. This is what happens to happen at the end of the game. Execution must tighten. Are you with me? Execution has to tighten. Uh, everyone's best effort has to be given in the last little bit of the game. The, the outcome of the game will be determined in the final moments. In close games, it comes down to those teams that can best execute, uh, best run the play together, best communicate. So in the last few moments of the game, there's no time for division. There's no time for distractions. There's no time uh, to... to uh, have a breakdown in communication. There has to be unity. There's no time for rest. Uh, there's no time to take any playoff. It's the last two minutes of the game, y'all. It's the last two minutes of the game. You got to execute in the last two minutes of the game. So the one term that probably best uh, communicates what happens in the last few moments of a game is this one term urgency. There has to be a sense of urgency. So this morning, I just want to submit to you that what I've discovered is that for most of us, one of the missing components in most believers' life that I know, and also, unfortunately, even we can say this, in most churches, is a lack of sense of urgency. There doesn't seem to be any urgency. In other words, I would submit to you that we have become complacent. Apathy seems to uh, roll in in the last few moments of the game. We become way too comfortable and we don't understand that time is ticking away. We, we become content. And while we slumber, the hands of the clock keep ticking down and they move and they sweep and time is lost. And it's just a matter of time before the game concludes. Uh, so I want to say some things about time that you need to understand this morning. If we're all going to be on the same page and we're going to give our best effort at the end of the game and we're all going to get in this thing, we're all in it to win it, right? We've all been signing up. We'll give another chance at the end of this service to sign up. But we're all in the game. We're all striving for victory. We're all striving to see so many things happen in God's kingdom and in our own lives. But there's some things we got to know. The first thing I want to submit to you this morning is this, is that the game is won or lost in clock awareness. In clock awareness, I can assure you, and I'm going to prove to you even from uh, some recent game footage that if uh, a player loses track of time, the, the amount of time that is left on the clock, the result can be disastrous. Watch this.
So he was oblivious, right? He, he was out of touch. He was unaware that there was still time left on the clock. He was not aware of the clock, and it cost them the game. So uh, I need you to do something this morning, if you will, with me. I want, I want you to take a look at the clock. Now, don't get your phone out or your... See, some, okay, you know how old you are by whether or not you have one, something on your wrist or whether you look at your clock on your phone. That determines how old you are. Uh, that, that is a recent study that the younger crowd looks at the phone, the older crowd looks at their, their wrist. All right? uh, but I want you to look at the, the uh, proverbial clock. Jesus tried to get us to understand and become aware of how much time was actually left and what part of the game that we find ourselves in. Here's, here's the clock that he gave us. He said that we would know the clock was running down when these things began to happen. He said, nation will rise against nation. He said that kingdoms will rise against kingdoms. He says, there will be famines. There will be earthquakes. And we used to think that was all about California. Welcome to Oklahoma. Uh, Because it also says, I like this little thing that Jesus said. He says, and there will be famines and earthquakes in various places. See, he knew. He knew uh, there would be rumors of wars. There, the, 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 the hate towards believers would increase. Felt that lately? He says the love and the passion of many believers would wax cold. I don't know what that sounds like to you, but that sounds like to me the two-minute warning. It sounds like to me that Jesus is trying to get us to understand that the clock is ticking down, that we're in the final moments of the game. Because this is what I've discovered. We see these things happening all around us, and if we're not careful, we're not clock aware. In fact, I would submit to you this morning that what generally takes place is as believers, we begin to see these things happen, and we see the clock counting down. What takes place is if if we're not careful, we just change the channel. We just, we just check out. We, just, we, we make statements like this. Well, those people are just stupid. I can't believe they feel that way. They're just dumb. Right? We don't, we don't understand. It's a clock issue. It's just a bad world we live in. That's what we say. What we fail to recognize is that this is a signal, y'all, that, that the, 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 the two-minute warning has sounded, that the bell has rung, that the PA announcer is starting to count it down. Two minutes left in the game. That's, that's literally what's taking place. This is a signal that Jesus gave us. And if we're not careful, then what we think is it's just getting worse. Have you, just, have you heard anybody say that lately? It's just getting worse. You know what? They're right. But they're wrong. Because not a, if we just stop and say, it's just getting worse, we've missed the point. Because what we ought to say is this, not that it's just getting worse, it's getting late. It's getting late. All of my life I've heard, from the time I was a little boy, watching uh, the thief in the night in the church gymnasium, scaring the mess out of me. And so, so some of y'all too too young, to even, what, thief in the night, what is this old, this old poorly done movie that scared us all to death, telling us that Jesus was coming back, Jesus was coming back. I've heard since I was a little boy that he was coming soon. So may I suggest to you that if it was soon when I was young, it's sooner, boomer, I mean sooner now. All right, all right. It's 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 sooner now. It's sooner now. Jesus addressed the need for urgency. He says this in John chapter four, verse thirty-five. He's talking to a woman at the at the well, a Samaritan woman, and he's trying to share the kingdom with her. And she keeps putting him off and putting him off and putting him off and, and making excuses as to why she can't really be talking to him and all this stuff. And, and we're going to revisit that story in the coming month. But but I want to show you what Jesus says about time. He says, "Don't you have a saying?" It's still four months until the harvest. I tell you, open your eyes and look at the fields. They are ripe for harvest. In other words, what Jesus is doing is he's confronting this idea of putting things off. Like, we've got a long time, four months, and then we'll reap the harvest. And Jesus is saying, no, you don't even get it. The clock is ticking now down. It's, it's harvest season right now. you got to get in the game. This is the two-minute warning. The game is counting down. The, the horn is about to blow. It's almost over. He's trying to get her to have a sense of urgency. I, I need to, to, to encourage you and challenge you this morning that we have to be clock aware. Uh, when, when we pray for our movers every Sunday morning, for some of you it has become nothing more than a routine. But when we lift that card and pray, we need to understand where that, that, that time is running out. We become clock aware. When we talk about outreach, we need to understand that, that we, we become urgent about it because the time is ticking 
down. When, when we serve, it's essential to serve with excellence, but it's also essential to serve with some understanding of where the clock is. You've got to understand that when you serve, you're, you're fighting the clock. And so we serve differently now. We're aware that time is running out. So now when I greet you, I greet you with an understanding that this might be the last days I, and it may be our last chance. And I, and I ush with a sense of urgency because I, I recognize that the time is... Cl- every little bit of the service, every little bit of your service matters because we're serving with urgency. Every song that you sing may be the last song. Every slide that you change may be the last slide. Every time you minister to somebody with a smile may be the last time. The clock is ticking down. We must operate. We must serve with awareness. It's our simple part that causes us to either win or lose the game. We must be clock aware. But not only must we be clock aware, I want to also tell you this morning that the game will be won or lost in clock management. See, there's a difference between being clock aware and managing the clock. Do I have any diehard football fans that understands the concept of clock management? It's it's a little bit harder in some sports, but in football, you got to know how to manage the clock. It's it, so. So if you are unaware, it happens in basketball too. I'm going to tell. I'm going to mention two two uh, instances where people didn't manage the clock very well. Some for the old folks, some for the young folks. All right, we'll see where you fall right here. Because if you're not aware of the clock and the and you're not managing the clock, then that can come back to haunt you. Just just ask Chris Weber. See, that's for the old folks. All right. So now just ask J.R. Smith. Just recently, what happens if you don't manage? The clock, well, the result is very simple. The, the result is always sure. If you don't manage the clock well, here's what happens. You lose. You have to manage the clock. That's why in John chapter 9, verse 4, Jesus says this. He says, as long as it is day, we must do the works of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. Did you get that? He's talking about clock management. He says, listen, while it's day, while there's time, while there's still time left on the clock, we have to serve. We have to do the business of the Father because there is a moment coming when night will come and nobody will be able to work. He's talking to us about managing the clock. Using the clock efficiently and effectively, making the most of every opportunity. That's why Paul comes along in Ephesians chapter 5. I'm going to read it to you out of two different versions. And he begins to talk about the end of time and the use of time. He says in Ephesians chapter 5 verse 16 through 20, he says, Making the most of every opportunity. What's he talking about? Clock management? That's what he's talking about. Making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Therefore, and then he tells us how to manage the clock. He says, therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another with psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit. Sing and make music from your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's talking about clock management. He said, you got to be aware of the clock, but you also have to make, you have to manage the clock and understand that you got to take advantage of every opportunity and you don't want to waste your time on stuff that doesn't matter. Out of the message, it says this, don't waste your time on useless work. Mere busy work. The barren pursuits of darkness. Expose these things for the sham that they are. It's a scandal when people waste their lives on things they must do in the darkness when no, where no one will see. Rip the cover off of those frauds and see how attractive they look in the light of Christ. Wake up from your sleep. Climb out of your coffins. Christ will show you the light. So watch your step. Use your head. Make the most of every chance you get. These are desperate times. Come on now. He's talking about, he's talking about clock management. He is saying to us that if we are not careful, as the clock begins to count down, we will begin to become so busy with life and the pursuit of things that don't actually matter that we will end up wasting the amount of time on the game clock that we have left and we will miss God-given opportunities. 
He says, you've got to use your time. He's literally trying to get us to stop and consider what are we doing? To, what are we doing for the kingdom? What are we doing with our life? What are we involving ourselves in that really matters? What is it that we're accomplishing in life that we can stop and say, that's kingdom work. He's literally trying to get us to consider how we use the clock. I want to say to you some, some this morning that my concern for us is that too many of us don't manage the clock of our life very well. I've noticed this happens that, uh, at least it did for me, when I was younger, there was an urgency about me. I, I need to save the whole world. Okay, don't look at me like that because some of y'all felt that way too. But then something interesting happens. Uh, it's called utility bills and mortgages and groceries and car payments and student loans. Word. All right. Uh, and all of a sudden, life comes crashing in on us. And almost unaware, we lose our sense of urgency. There was a, um, a, a, a real famous um, concert violinist, and she was just unbelievably gifted and talented. And she was invited to go all over the world playing the violin. And one day, uh, someone came up to her and asked her, what is the secret to mastering your instrument. How did you master the violin? This is what she said. I think this is profound. She says, there are many things that used to demand my time. She said, when I went to my room after breakfast, I made my bed, I straightened the room, I dusted and I did whatever seemed necessary. Then when I finished my work, I turned to my violin practice. She said, that system prevented me from accomplishing what I should on the violin. So I reversed things. Listen to this statement. I deliberately planned to neglect everything else until my practice period was complete. And that program of planned neglect is the secret to my success. She was destined to be, in her own mind, a great violinist. And she had planned neglect to accomplish it. Okay, some of you are looking at me funny, so you're not going to hear a pastor do this very often, so stay, stay with me. I am calling you to plan some neglect. Now, please listen to me. I recognize that according to Scripture, there are some things you can neglect that go against God's Word, and they become sin for us. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm not asking you to neglect things that would then become sin. But what I am saying to you is that most of us need to plan some neglect in our lives because the stuff that is surrounding us and buzzing around our heads and buzzing in our mind and buzzing in our heart are keeping us from becoming what God would have us to become. I'm suggesting that we need to manage time. Uh, there may be some good things going on in your life that need to be neglected because they aren't God things in our lives. Um, I want to ask you some questions before I take us into a time of prayer this morning and, and challenge you to get involved. I want to ask you this question here. What would happen? What would happen in your life if you were a disciple first. What would happen in your life. If you refused or you neglected your email. And your Facebook. Until you first. Read his word. I knew it would get quiet. It got quiet in my own heart. When I began to ask myself these questions. What would happen if before you allowed yourself to sit down and binge watch 92 episodes of whatever it is you binge watch on Netflix, that before you ever started the first show, what would happen is if you neglected that first and said, before I spend my time doing this, I'm going to manage my time and I'm going to go find somebody to share Christ with first. What if you served before you sat? What if you neglected the, the idea of just coming and marking one hour of time together in a service like this and said, instead of doing that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to serve first to make sure that everybody else has the opportunity to, to encounter God. I'm going to make sure that it's the best experience they've ever had. I'm going to do that first. Then when I do that, I will sit. What if we had some planned neglect in our own life that would lead us to accomplish His will? 
Jesus issues some final words that we need to hear. One of the, not the last statement, but one of the last statements that Jesus makes found in Revelation chapter 22, verse 12. Listen to what he says. He says, look, I'm coming soon. My reward is with me and I will give to each person according to what they have done. Jesus literally states almost as a final statement from him that he is coming soon. What does that mean? It means the bell has rung. It means that the whistle has blown. Stop the game. There's two minutes left. Get it together. Execute. Communicate. Get on the same page. Get involved. Reach out. Talk to someone about Jesus. Neglect the things in life that don't really matter and manage your time appropriately so that you're putting all your effort into the business of God so that when He comes to find us, He can look and say, that guy right there, he's about my father's business. That lady right there, she could have been doing something else, but instead she's serving faithfully and she's serving diligently because she understood that the clock was counting down. we got to get back to a sense of urgency. I can tell you that even as you begin to get ready to leave this service today, what's going to take place is the enemy's going to come along and he's going to try to cause you to slip back into contentment and he's going to try to slip you back into apathy and complacency and you're just going to mark it down as one additional Sunday. It's just another Sunday. we got another one coming. But what if we don't? Oh, I, I'll have another opportunity to tell them about Jesus, but what if you don't? I'll have one more opportunity to love on somebody that was in need. What if you don't? What if they don't? The clock is ticking down. We're going to do a couple things this morning. I want um, uh, Kim, if you'll come to the keyboard, uh, I want us to do a couple things. I, I want us first of all before I. Uh, call you to serve because there's still some of you that haven't signed up to be a part of the game and I first want to do this I, I want to acknowledge those of you that have I am so proud of you we've seen a good number of these cards come back to us each Sunday and some of you that have been sitting a long time have suddenly said you know what I want to get in the game some of you that have just joined us have said I want to get in the game and hopefully uh, if our leaders have done their jobs they've called you within 48 hours and said we're going to get you involved we're going to show you how to work it's all about getting in the game we're going to give you an opportunity on the last Sunday of game day, if you haven't signed signed up to be a part of the team, you need to use your time wisely. You need to be clock aware and understand that we're serving on purpose. We serve because we want to see people give their heart and life to Jesus. That's why we do this. And it takes a team. We've talked about that. You can't do this alone. Jesus, in fact, looked at us and said, don't you ever go anywhere by yourself. Go two by two. With power and authority. That's how we serve. So I'm going to give you that opportunity in a moment. But this is what I want us to do first. I want us to pray for a renewed sense of urgency. Some of you have been saved a long time. All right, let's do this. If you've been saved more than five years, raise your hand. That's what I thought, all right? If you've been saved more than 10, raise your hand. All right, if you've been saved more than 20. (laughs) All right, it's getting fewer. All right, if you've been saved more than 30. All right, if you've been saved since Moses was here. No, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. If you've been saved all your little life, it seems like, all right. I got saved when I was five years old, I think. A long time ago. I wonder for those of us who have known Jesus for so long. Listen to me, don't miss this. What if we've forgotten what a dreadful situation it is to be lost? What if we've known Him so long that we no longer really think or care or consider that there are people out there, as long as we get to have our holy huddle on Sunday with all the other folks that have been saved all their little lives? What if we've forgotten that while we're doing this together, there are people driving by that would come and be a part of this and get to know Jesus if one of us would simply ask, as if their lives depended on it. The clock is ticking down. I want us to pray together. I want you to do this. Just uh, I, 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 I struggle with how to make this happen, but I think this is probably the most uh, efficient way to do this. We're on a team together. Two by two. 
We're not in this alone. I want you to take your neighbor's hand right now. Well, oh, that's kind of weird. Well, I don't, get over it. Get over yourselves. We can't get... All right. Grab somebody's hand. Nobody ought to be by themselves. Everybody ought to have a hand. You can wash it here in a minute. All right, because some of y'all are germaphobes. I know you're like, oh. All right. Yeah. If you can't do that, do the, do the wonder to win power and put your knuckles together if you're scared of germs. All right. All right, let's pray for urgency. Would you do that with me? Would you pray that together we would become extremely, not panicked. This is not a panic. But we would become aware and we would become diligent again in our use of time. Father, this morning, I pray in Jesus' name that you would allow urgency to rise within us. God, I I, I believe that probably some of us are holding the hands or touching someone that their life has been overtaken by a sense of complacency and apathy has taken root in their life. And they may have been urgent at one moment in their life, but life has become heavy and difficult. And so this morning, Father, I pray that you would help us, each of us, to shake off apathy. I, I know there are concerns of life. I know there are bills and decisions and plans and all that. But this morning, I pray that for each of us, you would allow urgency to rise up within us. God, help us to recognize that the clock is ticking down. The clock is ticking down. The clock is ticking down. Father, I pray that you would point out areas of planned neglect that need to take place in each of us. God, there are some things that we may be spending our time on and in that in light of kingdom business can only be set aside as wasted time, mismanaged time. I pray this morning that you would allow us to neglect the things that we need to neglect that would allow us to have the time and the opportunity and the willingness to serve and to witness and to share. God, deep within our spirits, I pray you to do what I do what I cannot do. I pray that deep within our spirits, a, a, a whistle would be blown, a bell would ring, a buzzer would sound. And it would be like a, an alarm clock that would wake us up to recognize that the day is coming where we won't be able to work and we won't be able to share and we won't be able to witness and we won't be able to serve. And so, Father, this morning, I pray in the name of Jesus that every person that we're touching today would operate in a sense of extreme urgency, knowing that the clock is about to come to the final tick. May we see hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of lives changed, people saved, your kingdom expanded, Hell plundered, heaven populated. God, I pray that that would become the consuming cry of our hearts. I pray you'd do this in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Would you do this with me? I want you to get your little red card. I want you to flip it over and look at the back. And if you haven't uh, signed up to serve, this is your opportunity. We need you on the team. I need you to turn to your neighbor and say, have you filled out one of these cards? And if they say no, say, what you stinking waiting on? Sign in. Sign up. We need you to help us. We need you to help us. And when the offering bucket goes by here in just about three or four minutes, then you can drop that in the offering bucket. And one of our leaders will contact you within 48 hours and get you someone to, to serve with and to serve alongside and get you plugged in. So sign up if you have not. Write it neat so we can read it. The last but not least... All eyes up here for one second. In just about one month. Oh, by the way, happy 11th birthday. We turned 11 today, by the way. I don't know why that just hit me, but... About one month from today, we will be, through a sense of urgency, sharing a a dramatic presentation called Heaven's Gates, Hell's Flames. Today, on uh, the ushers are coming right now, I hope. Uh, y'all, y'all start moving. This is going to take a minute, so we're going to take just a second. We're giving you each three of these tickets. These are not for you. All right? Don't, please, sense of urgency. 
I know what's going to happen. I was going to let uh, Seth talk about this in the close, and I told him, no, I'm going to talk about this because I know what we do. I know what I do. You'll get these, throw them in the car, and they'll get covered up by McDonald's bags and Burger King bags, and you'll never even think about it. With a sense of urgency, three uh, tickets. We're going to give you more in the coming weeks, but three to start today. These are for you to go find somebody and say, hey, would you come and watch this at my church? Come watch me act. Come watch, come watch me serve. Come serve with me. I don't care how you do it. Uh, pick them up, bring them, and get them to join us on September the 30th, uh, which is a Sunday, by the way, at 10 a.m., and then that night at 6 p.m., and then that Monday night, October 1st, at uh, 7 p.m., we're going to present this drama three different times. Listen, listen to me, 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 listen to me. Just because we have a banner out in front of the church that advertise this, just because we stick it on Facebook, does not mean anybody will show up. It's still the effect, the most effective way to get people to come to your church is by you personally inviting them to join you. That's why we're doing this. That's why we're doing this. It's about an hour long, each, each presentation. It's going to take uh, 35 to 50 of us to pull it off just in the acting roles. You can sign up in the groom room. Seth will tell you more about that in just a second. But, but it's our opportunity, a concerted effort with a sense of urgency to recognize that the clock is ticking down so that we have the ability to tell our community these two facts. There is a heaven, but there's also a hell. And we want you to choose heaven. And we can show you how to do it. So will you take these? Come on, will you, will you make a commitment to me? You're getting three today. We're going to give you some more later. I've got a thousand of them. We've got three different presentations. Three different presentations. We'll put chairs out if we have to. But we want people to come and hear the gospel presented in a new, fresh way that maybe they've never heard before. Will you be urgent about it? Will you? Lives are on the line. The game is on the line. Souls are at stake. It's been a privilege to have you join us for this time of ministry. To find more Passion Church resources or to make a donation online, visit www.passionchurch.tv. Remember, you can't live without passion.